and welcome to the Touring Pro Series Virtual Mini Challenge Season 4, Round 2 from Zolder. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to live coverage of the second round of the 2014 Virtual Mini Challenge, live here on Touring Pro Series. We are here at the Zolder Circuit in Belgium, and as an added bonus, of course, Darkness has descended the Belgian circuit because for the first time in a long while in TPS, we have a night race on our hands. So this should be an added element to really spice things up, and fingers crossed we'll have two fantastic races to show for you tonight. I'm Scott Woodwist, and alongside me once again, as he was at Curitiba is my good friend and co-commentator for this season. It is Robert V.C. Mueller. Hello, Scott. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. This should be really exciting. The night race at Zolder in the minis. First night race in the minis, actually. The fourth uh, season now. But there were a couple of other night races in TPS before. There certainly were. Last what time we had a night race, I believe, was the Virtual Touring Masters back in Season 3 at Sebring. But we've also had races uh, before, night races at Trois Rivières and also at Laguna Seca. So, um, also remember the race at Laguna Seca in, in the second season of Virtual Touring Masters was a fantastic scrap between uh, Toby Davis and Kelvin van der Linde. Of course, Kelvin has uh, gone on to course into better things in the real racing world. And of course, we'd like, also like to say congratulations to Kelvin and his very experienced uh, GT racing teammate, René Rast, because they took themselves... Uh, a podium and a race victory on their first time out together as teammates at the ADAC GT Masters at Oscherslaven. So congratulations to Kelvin and to Rene. It's always great to see a TPS driver going from sim to reality uh, doing well. And we wish him all the best for the rest of the season. I think to say we're incredibly jealous that he gets to drive a GT3 Audi R8 for the whole season. Especially to get alongside one of the best GT drivers in the business currently in Rene Rast. He was an absolute monster in the Porsche Super Cup. And he's certainly proving his worth at the wheel of the Audi. So congratulations to him. Uh, so of course, we move on, of course to our races tonight the virtual mini challenge of course we're here at zolder it is a circuit that itself is four kilometers in length or 2.4 miles 2.492 miles in um for alternative circuit that has existed since 1963 and it's hosted the belgian grand prix for several years before in the 70s and 80s and it's uh, it, it hosted an infamous incident but uh, not for positive reasons of course it was the circuit that unfortunately claimed the life of uh, one of the greatest racing drivers that many believe who never even won the world championship gilles villeneuve was unfortunately uh before she perished here in 1982 in during practice when he hit the back of Joachim Mars's uh, rothman's march and he was thrown from the car into the catch fencing and uh, unfortunately Unfortunately, he did die from his injuries. But uh, not to put it on a, light, on a um, dampener at all, we move, move swiftly on to, of course, to our events on the track for this evening. And uh, before we um, go into it, um, Rob, let's just have a look at the championship standings coming into uh, tonight's uh, second round of the championship. Of course, we had wins for Paul Patrick and Adrian Campfield of Walk Racing, and they currently sit first and second. There was a small penalty for Adrian Campfield after Curitiba, which means he is now four points behind Paul, his teammate Paul Patrick. It's 57 points for Patrick and 53 for Adrian Campfield. Then Chris Butcher and Jesper Talbot, the THR Red Geo, third and fourth with 48 and 46 points apiece. Diogo Silva impressed Matt. Massively for GT Competizione to line up fifth, uh, with uh, Peter Hedenberg, the next of the walk racing guys, one of uh, three new drivers who debuted in the championship uh, for walk racing last time out. He is fifth in the standings, ahead of a, a resurgent Tommy Lee in seventh. Pipe Rodriguez continues to improve and is eighth in the standings, ahead of Gus Verva another new driver, and Jimmy Hughes, who put in a stellar showing for Optum Sim Racing. So, I mean, Robert, these new guys that have come in, of course, we've seen they put made, made an immediate impact, um, both for positive and negative reasons, but it's quite staggering just the impact that walk racing has had in only the first two races of the championship, where they've already got um, four drivers up there in the top ten, and many more knocking on the door, trying to get into that top ten spot. So they really are the team to beat so far, seem to be taking the fight to THR this season. Yeah, Walk Racing are very, very serious about this um, championship, and I think it already showed when they signed up uh, seven drivers for this league. They definitely want to win it this time. 
And yeah, Campfield and Patrick especially, they had a great first event where um, no one could really challenge them. You know, Patrick in the second race, he was charging through the field. But not only them, also the other guys. Peter Handenberg, for example, was really, really impressive on his first Touring Pro Series race. And yeah, they, they've got so many cars in the top 10 already, and it's completely deserved after the last race event. So um, this time will be interesting how well the other teams have prepared themselves for this event and how close they can come, and maybe they can even beat them. Well, well I think the rest of us are certainly hoping so, because of course the dominance that both Paul Patrick and Adrian Campbell showed as they pulled away from the rest of the field was certainly quite worrying, and nonetheless for teams such as THR Red, of course, with Chris Butcher and Jesper Tolborg rejoining the, the, the team after his stint at Spade Racing, uh, particularly racing in the Virtual Carrera Cup. Uh, but he's now back with the team it, it, behind the wheel of a THR machine alongside Chris Butcher. And again, this was another championship that we thought, Robert, that Chris could possibly have. He, he thought possibly could have been his best opportunity to win the championship after two years of try, two seasons of trying. But he's now found himself with a bit of a rude awakening with uh, the impact that Walk Racing's made. He's been forced to step up his game, and so far in practice, he has struggled a little bit but um, in Zolder. But it seems as though that uh, he's at least possibly in the right mindset, and he certainly seems to be determined enough to push on to try and close the gap to walk racing this season as they go forward to the next few races. Yeah, I think maybe Chris underestimated the level of competition a bit this year, because of course, Eric Spramer is not driving the championship, Lawrenson is not driving the championship. Um, I'm also not driving the championship, so a couple of main protagonists from the from the previous season aren't here. David Lund, for example, he's another one who's not driving the championship. But uh, the other guys have stepped up, especially Campfield and Patrick. So Chris Butcher, he really needs to practice hard if he wants to have a chance um, of winning his first championship here in the minis. Of course, uh, of course, you're not racing for the season. Of course, if you were, you wouldn't be sat here in the commentary box. You'd be out there having some fun on the track. But uh, nonetheless, uh, of course, um, moving forward, of course, look at some other teams as well. Uh, we can look at quickly at the practice times, obviously, before we head out onto the track to show you what's going on. Um, Currently, Campford and Patrick are the class of the field so far, but third is Tommy Lee once again improving. But the two, the team that seems to have really come on song for Zolder, at least, is Optum Sim Racing. And to be honest, we didn't really talk too much about them. And um, it's we have to kind of apologise for that because both Ryan Walker and, and Ben Haxon, uh, both for Optum Sim Racing, are seventh and eighth in the, in the times, or they were at least until they got until a couple more times came through. They've just been displaced by both Klaus Neering and John Monroe. But certainly two cars in the top ten for Optum Sim Racing. They're certainly a team that seems to be on the up at the moment and uh, certainly seem to be progressing in the right direction. So fingers crossed they can possibly take some stronger points finishes going forwards. Yeah, Optimum Sim Racing, they've also stepped up the game a little bit. They've improved the lineup for the season. Um, they, they got a very experienced driver in Ryan Walker um, midway through the VSS season last time around. And um, also, of course, um, Mate Orban, who made his debut in the front-wheel drive touring cars in this league. And when we've looked on the on the practice times uh, throughout the week, and then we could see Jonathan Ockerklin, who was up there with the best drivers. He was in the top three on the practice times. So, yeah, definitely uh, very promising optimus in racing on this track. Of course, this track is new to everyone. It hasn't been used in the minis before. So, um, the experience in the cars, it doesn't help you so much here, especially with the night and probably colder temperatures on the track. So, um, yeah, that's, this is a really good opportunity for the drivers and teams that haven't really been at the front so far uh, to shine. It certainly does provide a level playing field, of course, on the circuit that really no one's ever raced before in TPS. And, of course, with it also being a night race, you briefly mentioned, of course, that means we're going to be running lower temperatures than normal than we would have if we're running in a daytime setting, of course. So, I mean, for, for those who are unclear, but if you want, uh, what difference does running at night in, uh, and in cooler temperatures um, have on the drivers and have on the setup of the cars? Because, of course, it certainly means you have to kind of adapt the setup of the car to adjust it, especially with things like tyre pressures, to make sure that you're getting the most out of the car and the most out of the grip that you've got to available to you on the racetrack. Uh, the problem in the minis is that you don't really have so many setup options available to um, to change your cars. Of course you can change the tire pressures and this is probably the the most important, the crucial um, um, the crucial um, variable to change. And um, it means everyone has to put some effort in because no one has the experience here in the night. And um, yeah I think walk racing, if you could go on the live pictures now because they're in practice. I think Walk Racing, they're currently um, sitting very strong there. I know both drivers on 151.6. They've certainly put the effort in and found the right tire pressures for this track. 
I certainly have. That's an understatement because if you look at how their cars sit currently in the times, they're currently sitting with Campfield first, Patrick second, Verva in fourth, and near Hindenburg fifth, Nearing sixth, and Callan seventh. And that's an incredible spread of drivers. They've got six of their seven drivers in the top ten already, which is an incredible achievement um, considering that they have such a wide spread of talent, of course, across the board of the team. But, um, of course, Zolder, a brand new circuit, and of course you've had a chance to drive the circuit in these minis for a few laps. What are the standout sections of the circuit the drivers are going to have to, are going to have trouble on? Because we noticed already, whilst we've been talking, I've noticed at least, we've had several drivers going off at uh, the chicane up at Turn 5, which is the Kleiner chicane, which is a very tricky, sp tricky, especially with the uh, the tyre the, the tire stacks up there to prevent any drivers from taking advantage of going across the AstroTurf or across the kerbs too much. But um, are there any... It's, um, certain parts of the circuit they're going to be catching drivers out apart from the clients you came up at turn five yes the first sector is very very difficult on this track because uh, it's not so easy to position your cars to go through the corner sometimes you you can't you can go completely on the outside into the corner but then you don't have the proper line to drive through the section and um, especially the third corner is very difficult because you can't really see where the apex is so this requires a bit of practice to just figure out the lines and so on. And there, you can you can't really crash that hard in these corners, but you can easily go a little bit too early in, on the throttle, and then you understeer and get on the grass and lose a lot of time. And maybe if you understeer too much, you even get into the gravel trap. So that's very difficult. Then, of course, in the second sector, you've got the chicane, the, the very fast chicane with the two tire bundles, and there you can just go over them and uh, maybe roll your car. And then there's another chicane coming up, also with tire bundles on the inside. It's not so easy to hit them there, but still you have to be really precise that you don't lose time. And then in, into the final sector, and we're on, on board now with Ryan Callan, who's in the final sector. And that one's probably the easiest sector on this track, but still not easy, because there you see it. Another chicane with tire bundles again. So definitely not an easy circuit. And uh, when, when I was testing, um, <laughs> I was not really close to the times of Camfield and Patrick. I have to say that, so they've done an excellent job on, on getting onto speed here. They certainly have, and uh, of course they are once again the class to fill if you ride on board with Ryan Callan. And uh, one driver who's certainly also impressing as well at this point is this man here, Chris Shepard. Uh, another man who, he's one of the drivers for Puppy Racing of course, and Puppy Racing really were one of the sensations of Curitiba and obviously from past races that we've had going forward because they've kind of almost come out of nowhere and they have got drivers of course who've got exceptional caliber like Chris Shepard, Tom Willey especially who is currently third fastest on a 1 minute 52.053 uh, and also Oscar Hardwick who is 13th fastest currently 152.742 so across the board, I mean, Puppy Racing certainly are seem to be the dark horses um, of the season so far. And what kind of impact do you think they're going to have in the next few races? Because, of course, Tom Ely is certainly a capable driver. seems to be having a, resurg a resurgence in form since he's properly returned. Obviously, he was a former THR driver. Now he's come back with a different team. He seems to be a, almost a, a renewed driver in some ways because he really has stepped up his game. And it has really showed in both the clears and the minis that he's a capable front runner once again. And he uh, can certainly worry the, worry the big boys if he needs to. Yeah, well, first of all, we shouldn't forget that Tom Ely was uh, the setup guy for Ice Cold Racing last season. He was working on the tire pressures. And this track here is quite a typical track where um, Puppy Racing <laughs> is at the front, because the other teams like THR, they don't have any previous experience. Then there's the Knight, which, uh, you know, which makes it more important to work on the tire pressures, and Tom Ely is really good there. And then also the, the layout of the track, especially in the first sector with these corners, I think that's really, that's really good for him. And you know, Tom Ely, he always he always was a front runner when he drove. He um, he won a race in the Clios back in season two, and in the minis, especially in season two, he was very close to winning races a few times, but just didn't manage to do so in the end. So um, yeah, it's a new team, it's a new combination of drivers together, but um, all of them they've got massive talent, and I think Tom Ely knows at least from the you know, from the technical side, from the setup side, how to bring a team forward. So. Yeah, it's a very good combination, I think. Well, one driver, of course, who is uh, driving for the first time uh, this evening after the fact that he was not present in Curitiba is Andrew Waring. Andrew, of course, is racing also for Puppy Racing, so they've got more strength in numbers. Andrew Waring, um, a very prominent force in the Clios. Uh, as well as the mini, so he should be someone to look out for going forwards in the season. Uh, we've currently got a minute left of practice before we go forwards into the qualifying session. Of course, how it works in minis is very simple. You get two qualifying sessions where you get uh, to run as many laps as you can. 
which of course we'll see as we have before at Curitiba and many times before then uh, plenty of drivers running slipstream and running in tandem with each other with teammates in order to get that little bit of extra draft and straight line speed in order to benefit for, get the most benefit and the quickest time they can going forwards but um, of course Adrian Campbell currently faster than 1 minute 51.645 just a couple of hundreds ahead of his teammate Paul Patrick Tom Ely is currently sat in third and the top three are the only guys who have managed to get themselves into the 1 minute 51s of course a sub 152 lap with Tom Ely getting, being very impressive on a 151.7 then yes but Tarborg is best of the rest the highest of the 1 minute 52s but it's incredibly close for fourth fifth and sixth just literally uh, one hundredth of a second uh, separates uh, the two of them obviously with uh, Tobolk fourth Gus Verver fifth and Peter Hennenberg sixth with Klaus Nearing and Ryan Callan seventh and eighth Chris Shepard for Puppy Racing is ninth of what he was at least because Jarvan Osterklin has just jumped up straight to seventh to split the uh, four uh, the, the four uh, walk racing cars there is Jonathan we said he was very quick across practice. He's done a 52-2 straight off the bat. If he can go a little bit quicker, he might even be able to get himself into fourth quickest. And he certainly would be the surprise of the evening, especially as John has been striving to get towards the front of the field for many races. Of course, he is a stalwart of TPS. And how we would love to see him up at the front there, as Andrew Waring has also displaced uh, Oscar Clint now further as he goes to seventh quickest now on a 152.3. Uh, and, of course, we have other drivers going outside. Chris Shepard, of course, for Puppy Racing and John Monroe in the THR Orange Machine is now a length ahead of Ryan Walker, Oscar Harwick, Ben Haxon and Ricardo Di Carvalho with uh, the top 20. Uh, also around that by a few more drivers we can have a look by Luis Fernandez, Matty Orban, Chris Butcher and Andy van der Velde. Um, so of course we've talked about the circuit, we've talked about drivers that could be dangerous of course. Um, I guess really qualifying is going to be all crucial on a circuit like this because it's not exactly the widest circuit but then again the Mini is not exactly the widest machines in the world either. So. Is that going to mean that overtaking is going to be a little bit difficult on this circuit, provided the fact that it's it's fairly twisty and also these cars aren't going to be possibly running two or three wide despite that? So is it going to be pretty tricky for overtaking this, this evening in both races? Yeah, I think it will be quite tricky. Definitely harder than in Curitiba where you're at a long straight and you could just draft and get past someone. But also the gaps between the cars are a little bit bigger, at least at the front here. So I think uh, qualifying is quite important. Uh, I can also remember one race in the World Touring Car Championship where Gabriele Tarkini drove his uh, Seat Leon, which was completely underpowered, ahead of the World Chevrolet race for the whole race and won the race because no one could pass him. And I think it's the same here. You can make the car really, really wide and then you can, you can keep the position. So qualifying should be really important. And I think we see the walk racing. No, I'm wrong. I thought we saw the walk racing cars going out together for drafting, but it's actually a GT Competition car behind. Trying to work out who that possibly is. That's car number nine. So if I scroll through, in the GT competition, you guys, looking at their times, of course, they didn't really post anything. Well, they've got Luis Fernandez was back in 17th quickest. Uh, no. He's the only one who's uh, who's here tonight. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, we talked about this before the broadcast. Also, there it looks as though we are missing um, both Diego Silva and also uh, another driver that we are missing. It does oh. appear to be Pipe Rodriguez. So we're losing two of, our, two of the big players from GT Competition, but that does mean that that's a, a game for everybody else, especially for someone like Jesper Tolborg, who possibly could go forward. Of course, he is our most winningest driver in TPS. He goes forward to try and claim himself another crown, this time back behind the wheel of a THR machine. As the first few drivers are just heading out to try and set a few for their first few times, and I believe that already the walk racing cars are starting to get into team or I thought they were at least but I made exactly the same mistake that Ryan that Sir Rob just did that is a GT competition car behind not in fact another walk oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Fernandez is going to be a bit too keen with get too close to for comfort with those uh, tyre barriers because he certainly clipped them and put it up on two wheels and I think he possibly Robert that's going to be a recurring thing we're going to be seeing a lot of that in between the races people just taking liberties with those tyres getting a little bit too close and find themselves up on two wheels feeling like they're rust swift yeah, and you can actually get away with it when you just clip the tire barriers. It's not that you pick up the damage also. But of course, when you do it too much, then you just roll your car and your race is over. So, um, yeah, many people will try to take the risk, I think, in the race. And also in qualifying, of course, you've got... Uh, it's not a super pole session, so you can set more than one lap and you can just escape back to pit. So we we'll probably see the drivers going very close to the chicanes here. Yeah. Kelfield is actually coming up to the chicane now, to the Times 1. This is a very tricky chicane, of course, you approach it from the right-hand side, break at the 100 meter board, and this is a very tricky chicane indeed, the exit, much better, and does he take advantage of it? It's caught a lot of drivers out, including a couple of the walk racing guys in practice, 
as well as it did uh, also for Chris Butcher several times as well. So it seems that Campbell has taken it uh, with a plum. it seems, as he heads down towards the, uh, the next trick chicane, which is, I believe, on the circuit. If I have a look, it's the Terlamon box. In the sequence heading down, this all is, uh, is um, detailed out as turn seven, I believe. It's a long section sequence of corners. But we then head down towards the very tricky left uh, right hander at turn eight, the hairpin, which has got one of the longest corner names ever. I'm only ever going to say it once and then refer to it as turn eight for the rest of the night. But it's apparently known this corner is known as Boulder Berghaus, but Berghaus spelled box. And I'm not saying that again because that's too, what, one, one corner name too long. So we'll just refer to it as the turn eight hairpin, and, that's, and we'll go from there. So. Um, Jochen Rintbok is the little uh, left-right kink through turn nine, and then the Jackie Ixbok is the final chicane heading through onto the pit straight as he comes through right now. So Campfield will try and set himself for times. The first few times are coming through. Tolborg has just gone quickest on 52.3, but I'm pretty sure that Campfield's going to go ahead and trump that straight away, and indeed he does. 152.268, not as quick as he was in practice. Some six tenths of a second off his fastest pace, but certainly looking at ominous. And again, Ryan, as uh, Tom Ini goes to second, 152.274. So it seems as though that both Campfield and Patrick have the measure of the field, but Tom Ely, right in there behind them, he's going to be the one that's worrying them this evening. Yes, and I think Tom Ely, he's, he's taken over the role from THR in this event as the, you know, as the main rival of the walk racing cars. And it would be interesting to see, of course, they can all improve their times. So, um, very good banker lab from both Camp Fit Patrick, oh, and also from Torborg. But yeah, like you said, six tenths still to find, so um, let's see if they can get it in qualifying session. Quite possibly, as they head now down into the Terlamon box, this little sequence of corners. Double right hander, which then leads them towards the back straight that takes them back towards the turn eight hairpin. Paul Patrick, of course, looking for another pole position. After his uh, his qualifying for race two in Curity wasn't the best. He's now a tenth up in sector two as he heads into turn eight and looks for the power on the exit. Of course, the cooler temperatures means that these guys can take a little more, a couple more liberties with their. How much they use the tyres, but of course, tyre tire pressures, of course, are going to be key also, as we've talked about, as the walk racing guys start to form up in team formation just behind, and again, switching places down towards the Jackie X chicane, the left and then right and back onto the pit straight again. So, currently, Campford is up there, but so is Tom Ely. Tom Ely is up by almost three tenths of a second and he's current quickest, quickest time. We're just across halfway. Uh, Patrick goes quickest, 152.026, but we've got to watch out for Tom Ely. He's absolutely flying at the moment, up by three tenths of a second. And I wonder if he can find any more time in this far chicane. It doesn't look fast, but of course, he's being as smooth as he can. And sometimes, it, even though it doesn't look fast, it, it looks it looks slow. It does actually is actually fast. It's a bit of a counterintuitive, I know, but you have to deal with it. As Ely comes across the line, and he goes to second, just behind Campbell, who did put in the fastest lap of the qualifying session so far. And the first man to dip into the 151s, 151.966, ahead of 151.980. So Ely's certainly worrying the big guns. But so far we can have a look at, uh, look down the field. The highest place um, option sim racing car is this man, Matteo Orban in 8th, Luis Fernandez in 9th, and then we've got Jonathan Osterklint in 10th, Ben ha Ryan Walker goes to 11th, with Ben Haxton in 12th. So collectively, as we said, said Rob, the OSR boys really are turning up the wick in terms of their pace, and they've got four cars almost forecast knocking on the door of the top 10 great stuff from all of them yes and um, i think it's paying off that they um they got a little bit more consistency with their drivers now optimum sim racing they've been around for quite a long time now but usually they they had to a driver lineup for one league and then the next league they had a completely different lineup except for ockerklin who was in the team for a long time and um now they found some consistency and that's good to see and now they can really work with their drivers for um you know, for a longer time, and um, it's paying off. And someone like Matteo Orban, of course, he's famous for great results, in the, um, especially in the historic touring cars, like in the Virtual Touring Masters. But uh, he hasn't done any front-wheel uh, front drive leagues before. So this league here and the Cleos are the first leagues for him, and you can see he's already in the top 10. So yeah, I would say that's also down to the, to the team performance of Optimum that's massively improved nowadays. Credit to all the guys at Optimum Sim Racing for certainly going forwards and putting together a, a selection of drivers that is certainly proving to be key. Matty with that time on a personal best goes up to 7th, 152.525, he'll start on row 4 currently alongside Chris Shepard. The, the rest of the Optimum Sim Racing boys are currently showing as Ben Haxon in 9th, then we have Ryan Walker in 13th place and Jarvan Oscar in 12th, Ryan Callan goes to 11th with a 152.788. 
One thing I want to mention though, Chris Butcher only in 15th place at the moment. He doesn't seem to be quick at all on this track. We do know possibly that he hasn't been practicing as much as he usually would be. Mm. Though that possibly could be the reason why, but... Um, well, he isn't really practicing at all, usually, so... <laughs> that's not such a big difference. But of course the track is new for him. But it's new so. for everybody, of course. Yeah, and then he doesn't have the experience from, from previous seasons. He's been around since season one, so for most of the tracks he's got a base setup and he knows the corners and everything, and maybe this track is completely new to him, I don't know. But 15th place is certainly not what he was hoping for. Looking at Luis Fernandez currently on a personal best through Sector 1. Gold representative of GT Competizione this evening. Car number 9. One of the better looking liveries on the track, which they all look good effectively in the season. There's hardly ever a bad looking livery on the group when it comes to TPS. We've got some very skilled painters. You yourself, in course, of course, Rob, are a, uh, a, 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 a painter, of course, in the community. Of course, it's, it's nice, to see a, nice, nice to see and also important that if we've got a season like TPS in the minis, that at least we have a set of cars on the grid that um, at least look the parts as well as drive the part, isn't it? Yeah, of course. I mean, some of the teams, they've got some sponsors as well, like GT Competition, for example, which is a, a race center in Portugal where you can go and sim race with your friends. So uh, they want to, you know, they want to have their logo seen on the broadcast and look good and everything. So, of course, they try to get some professional liveries out there. Um, you can't really see them so well tonight, I think, with the, <laughs> with the night race. There are a few, a few lights out there, but many cars are, have a large part of black in the livery, so... I hope everyone can see um, who's on, on in the cars. Of course, they've got the big numbers on the windshield as well. So we see Chris Shepard heading back onto the pit straight. He was up on a personal best in set two, so he's currently going green as he heads across the line. Does he improve his time? He does. He moves up one spot to seventh ahead of Chris Shepard. And we currently also have both Peter Hedenberg and... Paul Patrick, who are ironically running no Sotel, no surprise there, as they are both in the same team. Currently on their final flying laps as the clock ticks down to zero and the flag is now out, which means that anyone who has currently started or is on a lap is Tom Ely goes to quickest in the session. Look at that, 151.818. But Adrian Campbell is straight on his tail because he's already a tenth and a half up on Ely's time. So walk racing leaving their fastest laps until the end of the session. But Tom Ely springing a surprise and saying, well, I've stayed behind you for most of the practice session. Have that, boys. See what response you can give to that one, Rob. Yes, and now that's really exciting because the walk racing cars are all on their final lap, so they've got to nail the lap if they don't want to lose the, the pole position to Tom. Looks very, very smooth from Campfield so far. Lap. Couldn't spot any mistakes, so it should be a good time, and of course he doesn't have to draft. Oh, there you go, still up in the second sector, but also Hennenberg and Patrick, so that would be interesting to see. Maybe they can all beat Tommy Lee, so who's going to be the fastest out of the walk, guys? The only question that's going to be answered in a moment, of course, half a tenth is easily lost if you get the line wrong, of course, but it has to have to be a mega final sector as Peter Hennenberg does go to second and Paul Patrick up to fourth so they've currently got cars uh, dominating um, fifth, second down to fifth but can Adrian Campbell find any more time in this final sector to get himself onto pole position he's currently on the second row Patrick is also up again and so is Hennenberg up towards the line is he going to be pole it's not he misses out he's a 151.879 so he does lose a tenth in that final sector however Hennenberg and Patrick have both given up nice. their laps so incredibly we have our third different pole sitter of the championship and it is incredibly Tom Ely who sets the pace 151.818 he takes the pole ahead of Adrian Campfield, Peter Hennenberg, Paul Patrick and Gus Verva it's walk racing second to fifth with Jesper Tolbol sixth also clicked with an awesome lap to get himself up to seventh place for Optimum Sim Racing then Klaus Nearing for walk racing eighth Chris Shepard ninth and Matej Orban for Optimum rounding out the top ten Rest of the grid going downwards, it's Andrew Waring in 11th, Oscar Harbert 12th, Chris Butcher, who uh, was up there again, possibly trying to challenge for a championship after two seasons of trying, is again back down in 13th place. Of course, not exactly enjoying the Zolder circuit this weekend. Then Ben Haxton in 14th, Luis Fernandez 15th, and Ryan Callan 16th, with Andy Vandervelde, Ryan Walker, John Monroe down in 19th place, and Javi de Carvalho rallying out the top 20. So what we'll do very quickly is just, just as the warm-up session is going on, we're going to step aside for one moment to give a shout-out to our very kind uh, forum hosts and uh, friends over in Inside Sim Racing. And we'll be back afterwards with the with the final few minutes of warm-up and the first race of the evening here at Zolda. It's going to be a, a, an absolute stellar evening under the lights here in Belgium. Stay with us. We'll be back in two.
Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. Welcome back to live coverage of the second round of the 2014 Touring Pro Series Virtual Mini Challenge here under the lights for the night races here at Zolder in Belgium. Of course, whilst we're racing, if you want to keep up to date with everything that we're doing over here at Touring Pro Series, we have, of course, many channels which you can explore going forwards over the coming weeks. Of course, if you put all the updates going forwards, head to our website, touringproseries.com, where you can find, the, of course, the Touring Pro Series Hall of Fame to see just who is the best TPS driver currently in racing company of past present and possibly future of course we have all over social media as well facebook.com forward slash touring pro series be sure to head over and give our page a thumbs up and a like to keep up to date with all the information if you can't find it over on touring pro series.com you can also get, follow us over on twit on tweet twitter uh, but you can tweet us at uh, twitter.com forward slash touring underscore pro and of course if you miss anything for this broadcast or any that we produce uh, across the across the summer or any race that you want to look back on that you may have missed or been recommended then head to youtube.com forward slash touring pro series where every single race that we broadcast is uploaded in back in full for you to watch at your leisure on our youtube page as well also a very quick shout out also that next week we stay in zolder because we have our second round of the virtual Clio series. We had a frantic battle going on in that championship, of course, and it was uh, an amazing run of form in both the races to see uh, some great racing up and down the board. So that'll be next Monday that you'll see uh, the minis back once again. That'll be back holiday Monday for anyone that is watching uh, over uh, in the UK. So, of course, it's a, what a better way to spend your bank holiday Monday than to, uh, with an evening with us at Touring Pro Series, watching the incredibly fun Clios. Of course, they put on a great show at Curitiba, and they do not, uh, will not disappoint, I'm sure, uh, next time out at Zolder. So, May the 5th, mark it in your diaries, and be sure to be around for bank holiday Monday. So Rob, let's just look back. Obviously, we've got about a minute and a half left before we get to the end of uh, what before we head out to the grid for our first race. And it, we were talking about in the break about the fact that um, Campfield was what well, isn't on pole because of the fact that he made a, a small mistake that you noticed at the end of his lap. Just talk us through what you saw in his lap that he did differently, which um, the likes of Tom Ely and possibly Paul Patrick and Gus Verver either could or should have done uh, that uh, he did differently on that one that saw him just lose out by a tenth. Yeah, well. <laughs> Um, Adrian, he was up on the time of uh, Tom Ely through the first and the second sector, and when he came out of the final corner, um, he was going back to the right side. And usually you do that because you need to go on the right side to go into the into the first corner, which, which is the left-hander. So, of course, you need to take a wide line into the corner, so you move to the right side early. But as the time was already up and the checkered flag was shown to him, he didn't really have to do that, so he could have just stayed on the left side and go over the line because that's a shorter way. And the gap was so small, I'm not really sure if this could have given him the advantage, but it's definitely possible that, you know, this small line change that he did was already enough to put him back into second place. But, it's, you know, nothing's lost for him. He's, uh, he's starting second behind Tom, and he's got a lot of teammates behind him to support him, while Tom is pretty much out there on his own at the front for Puppy Racing. Tom in these uh, one and only victory in TPS came at the Virtual Clio Series back in Season 2 at Sears Point. And from that race, he actually went ahead and won it from pole position. So this possibly, Rob, could be Tom's best chance to secure only his second ever TPS victory. And it comes at a time where he really has found a resurgence in form. And it's wonderful to see that uh, someone who has been around TPS for such a while uh, come back to form and be on the pace uh, back in a series like the Mini. So it seems as though that Tom possibly is really putting himself in the shop window, it seems, for uh, a potential... Uh, run for a champ for the championship as we now move into the race session. So realistically, of course, they'll have the likes of Campfield and the the seething mob from Walk Racing um, snapping at his heels. But realistically, what is Tom's chance here in this first race to grab a victory um, and to overhaul the dominance that Walk Racing has had? I think it will be really hard for him, but he needs to focus on his defending. Of course, first of all, he needs to win the start. And then he needs to focus on this defending, you know, a lot. And maybe he's lucky in the walk racing cars make some little mistakes or start battling between each other because, you know, they won't, uh, 
they won't be too happy if they always lose out to their teammates. So there's also maybe an inter-team battle coming up. But uh, yeah, Thomas got a pretty good chance to win the race, but um, won't be easy for him. Definitely not with all the war racing cars behind him. As the cars head off onto the warm-up lap, let's just reiterate the grid then for how they'll line up for round two, race one of the Virtual Mini Challenge. And on pole, it is Tom Ely, who's looking to take the fight to the uh, to the to the masses from walk racing. And of course, that charge is led by the man alongside him on the front row. It is Adrian Campbell in second. Peter Hennenberg, in only his third ever TPS qualifying session, lines it up on the second row of the grid. Alongside the man who won the first race and took pole in the first race at Cura TV, it is Paul Patrick. Gus Verver lines up on row three in fifth, alongside Jesper Talborg in sixth, our very own Iceman. Then we have Jonathan Osterklint, an awesome effort for him to qualify seventh for Optimus Sim Racing, alongside another walk racing car, it is Klaus Neuring. Then Chris Shepard and Matty Orban round out the top ten for a Puppy Racing, Optimus Sim Racing, respectively. Andrew Waring is eleventh, ahead of Oscar Hardwick in twelfth. Chris Butcher, back in 13th, he'll want to try and move up through the field early in the uh, first few laps to get himself up towards the top 10 and challenging the walk racing cars as quickly as he can. Ben Haxon, 14th quickest on row 7. Row 8 sees Luis Fernandez in the sole GT competition, the only car because there's no Pepe Rodriguez and no Diogo Silva in support tonight, or Miguel Cardozo for that matter. Brian Callan in 16th. As we go through the rest of the field, I'll let Mr. Uh, Mr. Beeson Willer carry on from 17th downwards as Ryan Walker makes up row 8 on the grid. In 17th place, Andy van der Velde for Rockhart, followed by Ryan Walker, the Optimus and Racing driver, actually the lowest qualifying Optimus and Racing driver in this race in 18th. Then John Monroe he would be pretty disappointed with 19th place, followed by Xavier de Cavallo, only in 20th. Matt Cape, they had, got, had a pretty strong event at uh, Curitiba, and now de Cavallo is their fastest driver only in 20th. 21st, Paul Crawford, the fastest independent driver in the field, followed by Jimmy Hughes in the second Matt Cape car. And then rounding out the field are Marcelo Tocco and Stefan Kosubek for the TK Racing Team. TK Racing still on uphill learning curve, of course, at the back of the field, but it's nice to at least have them on the grid and to have them racing within TPS. And just quickly before we go to the start and get ready for the lights as they start to form up on the back straight towards the pits, it's quite a surprise, isn't it, Rather, We've got quite a few top drivers who qualified down the field. I mean, if we look, we scroll through them, looking back at some drivers who are back in the pack. I mean, Oscar Harbour going 12th, Chris Butcher 13th, Ryan Callan 16th. Then we've got, of course, Ryan Walker 17th, 18th, sorry, John Monroe 19th, and Javi Di Carvalho 20th, Jimmy Hughes 22nd. These are going to be guys to watch out for in this first race because they're going to want to charge through and possibly have considerably better race pace than their single lap pace they had in qualifying. I'm especially looking forward to what Butcher and Cullen can do. Butcher, of course, because he's just one of the fastest drivers in the cars, and Cullen because he's got a walk racing setup, so he should be good, and also he's very, very, uh, he's usually very good charging through the field in these sort of races. Looking back there, that is the view that Tommy Lee will have behind him as they head towards the lights, and so they're going to look forward for the first 16 laps then, here at Zolder. The lights are up then, is it going to be Tommy taking a victory, or will walk racing overhaul him, getting ready to the fight? Under the lights at Zolder, lights out, and we're racing in Belgium for the first time. Good start for me to cover across, but look at the mob from Walk Racing behind him as they charge down towards Turn 1. He will have trap position and he will sweep across to hold on to the lead, possibly as they head into Turn 1 for the first time. Campbell is second, then Hennenberg, Patrick as well in fourth position, and also already Tolborg and Verver are battling over fifth and sixth place with Nearing up there in seventh. And I think Tolborg has got around him. Yes, he has. They're side by side behind as they head into the uh, next right-handed long sequence of right-handed corners. As they head through, looking back in the pack also, who's moved up through the field? I can see already that uh, Chris Shepard is into 8th position, Matty Orban not through the top, Andy Waring rounding out the top 10, but already Rob, the top two breaking away, and Eve with a great start, he holds the field, but of course, for the moment, it's a case of if, rather than, it's, it might be a case of when, rather than if, Campbell and Hennenberg get past. Yeah, but Tom Ely did a, did a brilliant start here, exactly what he needed, now he can focus on, the, on keeping the lead, and uh, trying, maybe trying to get a gap even, although that's pretty hard in the minis. I'm not sure what happened to Chris Butcher, by the way. He's not in the top 16 anymore, even. So, uh, that start, you know, that went very wrong. Only 19th place. This is the lowest that I've ever seen him in a mini race. Just moved up to 18th now. Tough times with Chris Butcher then. Back at the front, the top three are starting to pull away. And it is Tom Ely who continues to lead. They head down towards turn eight for the first time. And just behind, you can see, once again, they're still battling for fourth place between... Uh, Tolbo trying to go around the outside of Paul Patrick but can't get that move done and he's now possibly could come under attack from Gus Verver. He is the THR meat in a walk racing sandwich at the moment. 
to head down towards the, the Jackie Ixchakane chicane for the first time. And battles galore in the top ten, at least for the Battle of Five. And Hot Solwalk just he nudges the rear of Paul Patrick under braking. I'm not sure if he anticipated the fact that Patrick was covering the line, or possibly just didn't might find his braking point quick enough. But uh, there's a nice snake here of cars to head down the pit strip. But ahead of the field, it is Tommy Lee who leads by 0.8 of a second from Campfield second, Hennenberg in third. Then we've got this long train of cars headed by Paul Patrick. As now we've got, again, Patrick may be forced to go a bit too deep. In fact, he has. He's allowed the door, doors to be wide open for Tolborg. And there he goes into fourth position. And that could even give Gus Verver to go around the outside. Oh, it comes with Ockerklin. Ockerklin, it gets in the middle of both of them. There's a bit of a pinball match between the... It's used a pinball in between the two, two bumpers. And uh, he gets shuffled to sick, but he's now under attack from Chris Shepard. And Gus Verver was the man that lost out in that one. He's down to eight spots. So in the rear of the top ten, Rob, Rob faster frantic. And these guys are not letting up, even though on lap two. I'm surprised that Patrick is struggling so much in the opening laps because he was so quick in the last event. But uh, yeah, it's good to see Ockerklen so far up. He's got a big dent in, at the front of his car already. That doesn't harm him too much. So that's now Gus Verva now losing another spot now to Matty Orban, but he's now coming under pressure from another puppy racing car. That is Andrew Waring in 10th position. So decent qualifying for him in one of his first races back for a little while. And he might possibly try and throw it up the inside into the turn seven chicane. He did, he does. Oh! oh! There's Andrew Waring over off, over off onto his roof. My he was goodness. very lucky. We need to see a replay of that because that was incredible. I mean, watch here. This is on board now with Andrew Waring. Look at Andrew Waring. This is his point of view. Throws it up the inside and Rob just... I think he must have got squeezed onto the tyres, and look at that! How close is that to being in a complete rollover? Tom, I think Andrew Waring must be absolutely just... I'm pretty sure he was uh, firmly clenched inside that uh, puppy racing car, because that would have been a, certainly a heart-stopping moment. And thank goodness that car didn't go over onto its roof. It, it looked like um, he made a last-minute dive on, uh, on Gus Verva, and Gus didn't really expect him to go there and close the door, and that didn't leave... Uh, and any room and then he had to take the tire and he's lucky to continue. So, Edie now still leads by 0.6 per second but the two walk racing cars are battling amongst each other. Campbell having to go defensive on the inside line to fend off Peter Hedenberg. And Hedenberg of course is not as good of an unknown quantity. He's been, uh, he and his uh, compatriot from Denmark, Klaus Neuring, have certainly been uh, tearing it up in the Danish leagues and they've looked for a new challenge. They've come over to TPS and been secured by Walk Racing, and it's certainly been two very worthy acquisitions for the team because, of course, they are certainly making a name for themselves currently at the moment. Uh, Klaus Neering, I think, has possibly dropped back down the field. In fact, um, he's Oscar Harvick is out of the race, and Klaus Neering is also down in 24, so possibly an incident between the two of them, which we may have missed. So apologies for that one. Oh, Still he's on the inside. Okay. Right. What I could, what I could see in the last race from uh, Peter Hanneberg is that he's very, very careful. You see in the minis very often that drivers just, you know, they make a little bit of contact, there's a bit of barging when they make an overtake, because most of the time when there's a bit of contact, the minis don't really go off. And I wanted to say that uh, <laughs> Hennenberg is a bit more careful than that usually, but now he just uh, tapped the back of Adrian Campfield. So maybe I don't say that, but yeah, he, he showed great overview in the, in the first race, so, um, and now he also seems to have really, really good pace, putting Campfield so much under pressure here. I have a feeling that possibly Peter Hedenberg might say, might be saying to Adrian Campbell soon enough, um, get a move on, otherwise I'm going to overtake you. Because he certainly it feels that Hedenberg might feel he's the faster driver, but Campbell certainly holding his own. And uh, he's certainly, at least keeping him honest, he was kind of putting him under pressure through the chicane section. But now that Campbell has a couple, has about a car length or so on Hedenberg, he's not exactly under pressure, more kind of being kept honest by his Danish teammates. So as they head through the Jackie chicane back onto the pit straight, he's pulled out a small gap in this final sector. So Camp would certainly want to pull away and exert himself as the team leader for this point as Ely sets the fastest lap of the race, 152.328. And we'll see the gap that he's extended it out to in a moment as we get updated on the graphic. It's now 1.6. So thanks to the battles and the clean air that he also has, uh, Ely is now up to 1.6 seconds. If you look behind, the rest of the top 10 seems to be incredibly spread out at the moment. Of course, there's not really anyone who's close enough to be making too many battles as we have a look. I mean, we're looking at Ryan Callan here. In 10th place is Haxon and Hughes make a switch for 11th place. Haxon running a little too deep and allowing Hughes to get the switch back. And that could even bring Andy van der Velde in play in 13th place. He is the uh, no, car 78, the bright blue car uh, in the, in there as well. Uh, I believe we have been joined by Andrew... Oh, Andrew Waring disappeared. So, uh, Andrew, um, unfortunately... Uh, 
you had a bit of a heart stopping moment down towards turn eight. It's uh, fortunate to see you back out the race. First of all, um, just what happened from your point of view down towards um, the chicane at turn seven because you very nearly to getting that car onto its roof. Yeah, it was just. Uh... <laughs> it's like racing a slideshow out there, you know. It's uh, I know Oscar and I, we were just on the radio, and the pace lap was just brutal for us in regards to frame rates. So uh, we were like trying to turn off our lights as much as we could to save that, but it's it was impossible to drive out there. Um, and eventually, like when I went into that corner, I got a little contact, and it just made my computer freeze. And next thing I know, I'm looking at the ground. I'm like, oh God! And then um, just trying to chase down uh, one of the walk guys, and I just couldn't couldn't eventually deal with it anymore and I decided to just throw in the towel it's just it's too much it's too laggy I couldn't do it but it's technical problems on your end rather than uh, what happened as a result of the uh, oh. incident between uh, yourself and uh, one of the walk racing guys we're still just watching here uh, that is uh, Tolberg up to third place getting around Peter Hennenberg but it was technical problems on your end uh, Andrew rather than uh, what happened with the as a result of the incident with between yourself and the walk racing driver yeah just too bad if, just terrible frame rates for the server i guess i don't know i know oscar was experiencing it i know people at the back like in the middle were experiencing it i'm sure tom didn't though because he was up front go puppy <laughs> tom doing a great job for the team so oscar had the same problem i'm guessing of course he had to retire due to similar problems is that correct yeah he just does we just don't feel like you know it's all of a sudden there's a car breaking and you break and it's so it's so delayed you know you just don't feel like uh, taking that chance of hitting and ruining someone else's race well, hard luck. You were showing great pace, of course, to be up in the top 10, your first race back in the minis for a while. But so, uh, fingers crossed your luck will be ready, possibly for race two, if not for the uh, next time out in round three. Yeah, I'm going to go start deleting all my stuff off my computer, get this uh, CPU running better, hopefully. Well, fingers crossed. Thanks for talking to us, Andrew, and uh, hard luck you're out of race one. Yeah, thanks, guys. Andrew, wearing uh, a very surprise uh, uh, re retirement, I should say, from race one here at Zolder and that's a, that's a shame because isn't it Rob because he was showing some great pace but it just seems as though that for some drivers of course with their own PC systems sometimes obviously circuits like this of course when we're running eighth under the lights it does mean that the, the processors have to run extra uh, extra extra hard and there's an extra strain on them possibly and that can cause frame rate issues and it just seems as though for Andrew's system in his case it just got a little bit too much and unfortunately the system just didn't seem to handle it yeah, we also got two drivers who decided to miss the race because they felt their computer wasn't up to it and, you know, they feared that they would create carnage if they drive here. It's just unfortunate, but I mean, the night race was on the calendar in the first place, so, um, yeah, it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, back to the racing, ooh, back to the racing, though, <laughs> as we have Tom Ely and uh, Adrian Kempfield, he's closing up a lot. Yeah, Adrian Campfield with another fastest lap of the race into the 151s now, 151.953. Brought the gap down to less than a second, it's still 0.9, but both of them have dropped uh, the battle of a third between Jesper Talborg and Peter Hennenberg, with Paul Patrick just behind by about another second or so. So these uh, small individual battles where these cars are pairing up to square off against each other are certainly providing entertainment for you guys and hopefully you're getting the best of the battles at the moment. Talborg at least holding his holding his line and the, the pace enough pace to hold on to uh, a potential podium place as we are now on lap 6 of 16 here in this first race at Zolder. And looking back behind, also we look quickly behind uh, Peter Hennenberg. There's Paul Patrick in fifth. So he is now closing in at this point as we see the leaders sweep through our shot. Tell me he's still upholding on us. The puppy racing in there is Tolborg. Tolborg getting a little too close for the tyres there. Just clipping them slightly and getting onto two wheels. That's now allowed possibly Hedenberg to pull alongside up, up towards the breaking zone for the turn seven complex. And will he dive up the inside into the, the right hander here? Not quite. He'll slot in. And it has allowed Patrick to close in also as well. And also looking back behind, look at Chris Shepard in sixth place. He's also bringing Jonathan Osterklit into play with this as well. So 6th and 7th are still battling hard amongst each other. Also so are Gus Verver and Matty Orban with Ryan Callan up to 10th after qualifying outside the top 10. Uh, he's up there and uh, made a great um, progression up through the field so far in this first race. Uh, Patrick passed him back. And uh, Patrick has actually passed uh, his teammates. So a bit of an inter-team change as you said, right, Rob. And of course, it's, it's, this, this is more of a hindrance rather than a help for walk racing because... The harder they fight each other, the easier it is for the cars around to gain advantage. For Talborg especially to start pulling away and close up to, the, close up to both Campfield and Ely. And for guys like Shepard and Oscar to start closing in. So really, what racing have to resort really themselves out uh, as Adrian Campfield again fast lap at the race 151.844. The quicker they can stop battling amongst each other, 
then the easiest it's going to be for them to start closing in and actually get themselves some decent points and a chance to get possibly another one of their cars onto the podium. Yeah, but I think Patrick is faster than Hedeberg at this stage, so they weren't really battling, There's, it was just Patrick getting past Hedeberg. And um, it looks like for Patrick and Camfield as well, it just needed some laps to get up to speed here. Maybe they're running a slightly different setup or so, but uh, right now Camfield is the fastest car on track and Patrick is also making up the ground. So yeah, they had a pretty, pretty weak start to the race in comparison to some of the other drivers, but now they have certainly picked up the pace. But for Patrick, of course, he's uh, already 5.5 seconds behind Ely, so uh, yeah, probably doesn't have any chances anymore to get them uh, to get the win. Speaking of chances, Matty Orban looking to try and create one down towards the chicane. And so, oh, and that's that's what we talked about, taking liberties with the chicane for Gus Verber, clipping the tyres, and that's just given Matty Orban the prime opportunity to go side by side down towards the Turn 7 complex. And he will force it up the inside, he will have track position. I think that uh, Berber tries to be brave around the outside and it hasn't worked. And it now gives Ryan Keller a chance to get himself up the inside. And again, it's into team battle between the two of them as both the Warp Racing guys almost go onto the grass. And that now gives Callan the run up the inside as they go side by side up towards the turn 8 hairpin. Callan will have the run and track position. And unless Verbo pulls across, which I'm not, not quite sure why he wants to do that on his own teammates, he does indeed slot behind it, back in behind Callan, who's up into the top 10 in ninth position. But they're going to go side by side on the exit again. And Verva, even though he's the, one of the new boys here in TPS, he's certainly not uh, bowing down to an experienced hand like Ryan Callan. He's taking the fight to him, even if, Rob, they're both teammates, he's certainly giving him something to think about. Yeah, but of course, walk racing, they've got so many cars out there, they can't just, you know, drive team order between all their cars throughout the whole season. That just doesn't work. There's too many drivers that have their own interests of getting positions and so on. But I, I like to see how, how Gus Berber drives in the race. He was a bit too aggressive and in the end it probably cost him two positions here, but he's got the speed, so let's see, maybe he can regain the positions. Looking from the bumper cam now, looking forward at race leader Tom Ely. He's done so now for seven laps. We're now up towards the halfway, coming up towards the halfway point in this first race. And so far, Ely is holding enough pace to keep in the lead. But, but Rob, Adrian's been closing in these past few laps. So surely, now that he's up to speed, it's only a matter of time before Adrian does close in and make a move. Well, he certainly seems to be the stronger car in terms of race pace initially. And he was certainly more confident there through the chicane than Tom Ely was. He's right onto the rear bumper underneath the rear wing of the puppy racing car. He's going to the outside down towards turn seven, forcing Ely to try and take the inside run and go defensive. And Kevin will be trying brave to go around the outside. He has to slot in in the middle part of the chicane. But as they get the power back on out of the complex and back towards the uh, the right hander, which takes them up towards another up towards the crest of the hill towards turn eight. Kevin will possibly lining up Ely for a pass down here. Robert could be his chance that he's been looking for. It's difficult to really get the chance to make a move here if Ely doesn't make a big mistake. Maybe here on the outside, but he doesn't get a much better run. So um, probably he needs to wait a bit, but it certainly looks like uh, his car is a lot quicker at the moment than Tom's. And also intriguingly, Tolborg and Patrick have closed the gap into less than five seconds, so they're starting to up the pace now. They kind of use each other to try and close in, but Camp were looking very menacing behind us again in the background. Is that a change for third place it might because Patrick's got around Talborg under breaking for the Jackie X chicane but Talborg will be back in the draft he's lit he look at that he's tucked right underneath the, the, the rear wing of car 71 in front of him the walk racing car of course they run the same numbers just the other way around between each other as they head down towards turn one and Talborg again just looking for the move that he can try and make and just in front they still haven't changed places between Ely and Campbell but surely it's going to happen sometime soon unless Ely can put up a sterling defensive effort to hold on to that place and we'll see now, now we'll see just exactly how much pressure the Ely can sustain. Meanwhile, Patrick is coping perfectly fine, keeping Talborg at bay, even though Talborg is looking the racier of the two drivers and almost pushing Patrick around onto the back straight as they head towards the sea. Very tricky chicane, one of these very treacherous parts of the course. As again, the leader sweep through up the front of our shot. Campfield still giving chase to Tom Ely at the front as they head into the chicane. And this is this, this trio of cars here. Patrick, Talborg and, Hennen and Hennenberg all for third, fourth and fifth. Or sits Hennenberg in car, Patrick in car 71. Talborg car 17 and car 35 is Peter Hennenberg. Then we've still got she Shepard and Ossica that's battling for sixth and seventh. Orban is currently holding on to eighth spot but he's coming up to lap one of the TK racing machines with uh, Ryan Callant has got around Gus Verve and stayed ahead of him. 
uh, and, and that rounds up the top 10 for those guys with, with Jimmy Hughes. Look, Jimmy Hughes up to 11th spot after he was way down the way down the field. And he's charging up now to get himself through as they head into the rest of the field. And uh, the top two runners continue to lead. But Catford is putting Ely under some substantial pressure. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, it's another retirement that we've had, unfortunately, in the race. Who's just joined us in the commentary box, uh, Chris Butcher. Chris, not exactly, you, to be honest, you weren't exactly showing the best pace this weekend. But unfortunately, you asked the race already. What's happened? Um, well, on the first lap, I took a, a massive hit in turn one twice. Um, and the car was just ruined after that. It was awful to drive. I had no straight line speed, no grip. Just it was awful. And then in the um, in the first cane, I, I clipped the inside tires, then clipped the tires on the exit, got all um, out of shape, um, and then span trying to avoid taking out John and Ryan Walker went into me, and I smashed into the barrier and lost my front left wheel. Well, certainly bad luck, of course. You had a you had a fairly decent run at Curitiba, at least. Uh, for points as well. I mean, in terms of race pace here at Zolder, I mean, apparently you just haven't had the chance to practice here this, this weekend. So, I mean, is it the circuit that you find difficult? Is it set up things? What is it that's just not going in your favour for this weekend so far? Sorry to interrupt you, but there's a change for the lead. Camfield, oh, contact Ooh. in the chicane. <sighs> I think he's clipped the tyres. It's good to point out we're watching the battle in the background. We'll come back to oh. the second race. <laughs> They're side by side for the lead. Camfield's giving him no room. Back. Contact again. You may try and move back up the inside, and Camford has the run up the inside under brakes. Is he going to go straight on? He's going to have to get it anchored up, and he has indeed. So there is a change of a lead on lap 10 of the first race at Zolder. Adrian Camford into the lead. Ely is currently right underneath the rear wing of him as they come back towards the across the, over the crest towards turn 8. So he might try and make another move down towards... The yeah, Ely has to make a move make pretty soon, because Camford looked faster than him, and I imagine Ely is not happy about this pass from Camford because they made contact into the chicane, which is really no place for two cars to go alongside. You know, Camford made contact, then clipped the <laughs> clipped the tire and stayed ahead. So, yeah, pretty pretty aggressive move from him there. He's coming back on the outside now under brakes. If he's going to try and get a little bit later, can he go around the outside? He's certainly going to try it, and Ely will have the inside run of the chicane, but he won't because Camford sweeps across the front end of the puppy racing machine. And Campbell now currently leads once again. So he will lead for the first time in this race across the line. He will lead a lap and hopefully will try and stay there. And already has a half second advantage across the line. So he now currently leads ahead of Tom Ely in second. Now Chris, back to yourself, of course, we said. I mean, just not exactly on the same pace as you had in Curitiba as you, as you have here in Zolder. Um, is it lack of practice? Is it difficulties with the setup? What is it that you're finding um, is compromising your pace here at Zolder this weekend? I think the entire team struggled on setup, to be honest. But um, me, I've just it's just practice, to be honest with you. I thought I was, I thought I'd found a little bit of pace. But I kept messing up qualifying, to be honest with you. Um, so I was quite happy with twelfth, uh, thirteenth even. But I, I could have done a little bit better than that. But yeah, it's just just lack of practice for me at this one. So obviously you'll be back in for race two, of course. Now you're hoping possibly for a better fortunes, of course, to try and be a little bit closer to the top ten in qualifying. Hopefully, I, I think I can break the top 10, um, but not, you know, it's probably like 8th, 9th, 10th, I don't think much higher than that. Um, and then we'll just see how the race goes. Well, fingers crossed you can improve, and hard luck for being out in race 1. But uh, Chris, thanks for taking the time, and um, hopefully we'll see you back up at, near the front of the field, or in the top 10, at least getting race 2. No race, thank you. So another big name goes missing out of the, champion, of the race in Chris Butcher, and of course he'll want to try and uh, recover for race 2. Uh, Rob, that's always tough, isn't it, for Chris? He's, he, he never seems to have luck go his way in many cases. It seems to be the case if he gets a good run going, and all of a sudden just it takes one little thing just to, you know, to to knock the the you know the the, the run of the run of consistency, you know, the, the momentum that he has. And it's a shame to see that because, of course, I think Chris has been so many times the bridesmaid, never the bride, when it comes to a championship victory. And surely he's overdue one in the, in the near future. In in this seat, in, if not for this championship, then at least for the Clio's. Uh, to be honest, in this uh, in this season so far, it hasn't really looked like he's uh, he's fighting for the championship. In the first race, okay, he got the pole position. In the second race at Curitiba, but he was uh, he had no chance against the walk racing cars. And this round, you know, it was very unfortunate that he was out so early. But um, of course, he qualified way down the field, so uh, certainly has better chances in the Clio's. And there, he's uh, I think second in the championship. So oh, then we see a move from Jonathan Ockerklund. Certainly do. Looking at the rear wing, he's managed to force Chris Shepard wide. This is Osterglick for sixth to be top of the OSR drivers. He currently is leading, of course, his team at the moment. And they're going to head through turn three. And 
Osterklint has the run and he's got himself into sixth place, but this could be the chance that Shepard needs. He'll try and pull himself back alongside. So it's unfinished business here. He's not willing to give up that position easy. As the leaders are once again sweep through the front of our shots. Nosklet still has the inside run and he will, will cut across to grab the line he needs for the chicane. But it gives, as a result, Shepard the better run off the corner. And again, underneath the bridge and over the crest, they'll go side by side. And Shepard, let's see, let's see how brave he is to keep it on the inside run into the corner. Whether the Osklet will have trap position. Shepard is back in front and he is to the sixth position once again. So Osklet's advantage lasted all but a few corners because Shepard had enough tenacity to force it back up the inside and get the job done uh, once again. So it's now a roll reversal once again. Oscar doing the chasing. Shepard is being hunted down for sixth position. But uh, heading down into turn eight once again, looking down the rest of the field, uh, we've got Matty Orbang back in eighth place as he's pulled away. And the two walk racing guys behind him have switched places once more. Uh, 86 in front of 68. It's now Gus Verver ahead once again of Ryan Callan. Uh, rest of the Jimmy Hughes up to 11th. He was at the back. He was starting near the back of the field. But he's done a great job to move up through the order into 11th spot. Currently fending off Andy van der Velde in the bright blue car behind him. Then we've got Ben Hacks in the 30th. John Monroe with a very quiet race and battling with the sole GT competition. The only car of Lewis Fernandez. Ryan Walker has been in all sorts of troubles after he got hit by uh, Chris Butcher. They see him missing his front bumper as well as a legacy of that contact. Uh, also... We have Paul Crawford in 17th, one of the independents, and Javi de Carvalho having a very lackluster race in 18th, with Marcelo Tocco and Stefan Kosebeck uh, in the two TK racing cars rallying out the field. Of course, we've lost Chris Butcher, Andrew Waring, Oscar Hardwick, Klaus Neering. Uh, as the four cars we've lost here. But back to the front, and Rob, Tom Lee is still, despite the fact we thought that Campford had better pace, he's certainly keeping... Um, He's certainly keeping Campford on tender hooks at this point, and it becomes the last few laps of the race. So maybe, if you can force a mistake from Campford, there could be a chance that Gidi could get back through here. Yeah, he's definitely close enough, and I thought he's, he's losing the, you know, he's losing the draft and so on, but he certainly isn't anymore, and I think Ely needs to be Ooh. a little bit of contact, but I think Ely needs to be very aggressive here, Campford's cutting the corner there. But and that, oh no, he's no, he's lifting off. But he was cutting the corner there. It was caused by the contact, but of course he got a nice, nice little gap by, um, you know. By leaving the track boundaries here. There you see he's lifting off, I think. Certainly can't gain an advantage like that. I think if Ely wants to win this race, he needs to be really aggressive with the pass on, on Camfield because Camfield certainly, you know, he will push hard for the win. And there you see the other two cars catching up. Yeah, we've, we've almost forgotten about that. Of course, the Paul Patrick and Jesper Tolborg have been quietly closing in in this gap between the lead to, to the leaders, between themselves. Paul oh, Patrick. Shepard is out. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Chris no, Shepard. No, of course. Uh, Chris Shepard out of the race with suspension problems. So, let's see if we can possibly get a replay as to what's happened to him. If we can at all. Uh, I want... uh, do we have a replay at all? It's not showing anything at the moment. So, possibly if there's anything we can see, unfortunately. I uh, don't appear to have a replay, unfortunately. But, uh, that is a real shame. The fact that we have lost both of these guys. They head now forwards into the... Uh, the closing stage of this first race. Chris Shepard was running so well. He was up there in sixth position, battling with Jonathan Osterklint. Now, I I don't think them. I'm not suggesting there probably was contact between the two of them because Osterklint was very close to, close in proximity. Now he has lost his front bumper. I think. No, it's still there. No, it's, it's still just there. painted it's, black. It's, it's, it's just painted black. That's the confusing part of it. So, Optimus Sim Racing that car still has that bumper, but was there contact between the two of them? We can't tell because our replays won't let us go back that far or show us exactly what may have happened to him but possibly an off for Chris Shepard at least which has forced him to retire from that race and that's a shame because he really was showing some great form in the second highest puppy racing car and that's valuable points that they'll have lost towards their championship fight back with the leaders and Adrian Campford what's still being kept honest by Tom Ely Ely's now dropped back to half a second meanwhile Battle of the Third still rages on Paul Patrick now has half a second advantage over Jesper Tolborg at least upholding honours for THR Red as Chris Butcher is now out of the race and off the pace it seems this weekend as we've heard and he's now looking pretty racy indeed and oh that could be compromised and that's one of the TK racing cars uh, trying to move out of the way by taking uh, a much more obscure line on the in on the in on the inside of turn 8 but the better exit seems to have benefited Paul Patrick as he's now pulled the gap that he, he needs and Ely now is good that he can close under braking doesn't seem to have enough tenacity to push on and use up his tyres for these remaining two laps. 
in order to close in. Well, the gap between them now, it's up by another tenth of a second. It's now 0.7. So, is Ely possibly just falling back here because of tyres? Or is it the fact that he's sitting back and thinking, well, I need to possibly uh, run the best race I can and not take too many risks? What exactly do you think is going through Ely's mind at this point? Uh, if you were in that situation really right now, Rob, of course, with two laps to go, you're chasing after um, the, uh, the man that you battled for in the lead of the race. You lost it with about six, a few laps ago, despite a couple of attempts you haven't got through. What approach or what mental approach do you need to be taking in order to go forwards and try and stay, stay positive and stay focused to try and close in on this kind of battle? Well, I think Ely really needs to stay focused now because otherwise he gets reeled in by the two guys behind him. So um, I think he just needs to say okay maybe i lost the position there nothing i can do about it now let's try to push maybe the guy ahead of me makes a small mistake maybe i can stay in the draft and then at least i get a podium and if i'm lucky i get the win so he just needs to stay positive and uh, shouldn't worry so much but I, I don't think he does that he's been running a little bit wide i could see that before but um yeah his tires seem to be still good enough to to keep his position especially when Torwood maybe starts putting patrick under pressure here He's certainly doing some, taking advantage of that at the moment, and I think possibly that Talborg could maybe, if he's got enough pace and, and pace and life left in those tyres, be shaping up Paul Patrick for a pass on the last lap to grab third place. He's certainly close enough, but it all depends on just if he can get himself close enough to make a move that's going to be worthwhile. Send one down the inside, or possibly make a late breaking move. He won't be here into the final chicane. Since we talked about that, I mean, Elias dropped back a further tenth, so he really is, is going to have to pull something extraordinary out of the bag here to close in and snatch the victory back once again for Major in Campford, who crosses the line to start the final lap here in this first race at Zolder tonight. Apparently, he leads then by now still 0.8 of a second, and can Ely now turn the wick upon a puppy racing machine? Car 69 to make the move, but once put behind them, if it, it's not a change for first. It could be changed for third because Paul Patrick once again being put under immense pressure by Jesper Tolbo. There's the view from the rear wing and that's how close she wants it. Tolbo trying to get his nose up the inside through turn three. But Patrick has the line covered. Head through the right hander of turn four. And onto the back straight for the final time. And is there a chance here that in the slipstream because these minis are quite aerodynamic and the effect is quite prominent in the slip in the toe. Tolbo could maybe get himself into a place to make a dive up the inside. Not here at the Clyde Chicane. What about up the hill now towards turn six underneath the bridge? Won't be here. Doesn't look as if he's quite close enough here. Maybe he's waiting until the final corner to make his move. Edie's still closing in, just pushing as hard as he dares. But I think possibly it could be all in vain. And look at how close Tolborg is. He really wants that third place. And I'm pretty sure that, I'm sure if he doesn't throw up the inside to turn it, he'll definitely make a dive into the final chicane to relieve Paul Patrick of a podium place. It could be three different teams on the podium. And Tolbo does something right now. He is going to the outside. There could be a change. Sweeping around the outside. I think there could be a bit of contact. But Patrick has defended well. And he looks as though he's going to deny Tolbo unless he throws up the inside with one do or die move into the final chicane. We'll have to cut to, Pat, to Adrian Capford in the moment as he is coming up towards the final corner. And here comes Talborg, really forced the inside move. They're going to make contact. And Talborg with a very cheeky move. Is he going to make it stick? They're going to be side by side on the exit. And Talborg well over his nose in front. Meanwhile, Adrian Campfield takes the race victory here at Zolder. It's Ely second. And for third place, Talborg with a very crafty third move on the final corner. That was a brilliant move from Jesper Torak. Patrick tried to be cheeky and cut him off in the breaking zone, move from the breaking zone. Torak had nothing of it, sticked his nose in, pulled through, got the position. Great move from him. Deserved podium. The Pat Tolbo, with all his wit and tenacity and experience, grabs a third place on the final corner with some great, a great passing move as judged by Robert Pisi Mueller, and I can't really disagree with that one. Peter Hennenberg, fifth. John Osterklick with sixth for Optimum Sim Racing, ahead of teammate Matthew Orban in seventh. Ryan Callan finishes 8th ahead of Gus Verver in 9th. So the two court walk racing cars switch places once again. Jimmy Hughes 10th ahead of Andy van der Veld in 11th place. John Monroe fought up to 12th. A very quiet race for him. Not exactly in the spotlight at all this weekend so far. 13th Lewis Fernandez. 14th Ben Haxon. 15th Ryan Walker. 16th a very happy Paul Crawford getting himself uh, a top 20 finish ahead of Marce uh, Javier de Carvalho 17th. He crawls across the line for reasons I can't exactly figure out. Maybe he's run out of fuel. I'm not sure. Well, that, it looks as possibly... He, was he carrying a bit of damage there, of course, possibly? It looks as though there was something wrong with that car. 
It's hard to turn off. I made it over the there's line. No, there's, there's no damage, so... They, oh, he's, he, was break, he was breaking across the line, that's what it was. He wasn't out of fuel, he was just taking it very slow across the line. The 17th was Javier Carvalho, we thought out of fuel, but just purely just going across the line very slowly. Marcelo Tocco, 18th, and Stefan Kozibek, 19th, and that's but they didn't even have 20 finishers. We lost somebody else in that back during the field, which is uh, rather surprising. But uh, we're going to take a, a quick break after of that race. Campfield takes the first race. Will he repeat it? It all depends on how these guys get on in qualifying for race two. We'll come back to that in a moment. But, of course, we're going to step aside for one moment to let um, our friends at Inside Sim Racing give them a quick shout-out, of course, for their forums and their wonderful support. We'll be back in two with some analysis from race one. And looking forward to race two here at Zolder. Back in two. InsideSimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. Welcome back to live coverage of the second round of the 2014 Virtual Mini Challenge here at Zolder. Race 1 is in the history books and the victory went to Adrian Campfield for the second time in this season. He takes the victory ahead of Tom Ely second and a beautiful last lap pass from Jesper Talborg secures him a podium spot. Three different teams on the podium. Great to see. Diversity of talent and diversity of great teams in the championship. Quick reminder, as we'll remind a couple of times throughout the broadcast, of course, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, of course, it's touringproseries.com for all the info, of course, including uh, features such as live timing and also our TPS Hall of Fame, so you can keep up to date with everything in terms of who is the best and greatest drivers that uh, TPS has to offer, both past and present. Uh, also, we have our Facebook page. You can give a like and follow all the news on there, too. That's, uh, of course, including some fantastic images that are, are taken and rendered by our good friend Jesper Talborg. And, uh, of course, they are all uploaded onto facebook.com forward slash Touring Pro Series. Also, you can tweet us at Touring underscore Pro or twitter.com forward slash Touring underscore Pro. And if you missed anything of Race 1, if you're just joining us, uh, not a problem. First of all, where have you been? And uh, secondly, if you want to catch Race 1 back, if you have possibly missed any of it at all or all of it, then this race, in this broadcast, along with every single other broadcast that we do, gets uploaded back in full on youtube.com forward slash touring pro series. Hit the, hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss uh, a rerun of a broadcast again. And of course, speaking of broadcasts, our next event is going to be, of course, showing next Monday is the second round of the Virtual Clear series. Back here once again at Zolder. And we'll have all the action there, of course, going forward. Hopefully, it's going to be another run for THR. Of course, they were very dominant in the championship going forwards uh, for race first couple of races in Curitiba. Will they continue that streak? We'll have to find out next week. It's next Monday. Bank holiday Monday, uh, of course, for those on the UK. As we said, what better way to spend your bank holiday Monday evening than to uh, come and watch some top quality tin top sim racing here with TPS and the virtual Clio series. So, moving forwards then into the second qualifying session for race two. And, uh, Rob, we've got a, quite a bit to talk about, I guess, I suppose, in that first race because it seemed as though, for the most part, that Tommy Lee had the measure of Adrian Campfield, but just Adrian, in the middle part of the race, put his foot down and got the move done he needed. And it was that crucial pass that he made, despite the fact that Tom came past, tried to come back a couple of times. He held his line enough and enough enough to um, keep the place and that's again that's more crucial championship points for him and a crucial victory if Campford wants to put himself as a championship contender this season yeah, it was a very forceful pass from uh, Adrian Campfield and Tom Ely but he made a stick and uh, Ely tried to get back past Rue and he couldn't manage it so uh, another win for Adrian Campfield and he's looking very strong for the championship um, something I want to say first though which is not really related to the race but we had some drivers dropping out with, uh, with frame rate issues. And I've uh, just received a message from my fellow THR co-owner, Toby Davis, that people can turn off the headlights in their PLR file. So maybe if one of the drivers is watching the broadcast right now, who had trouble before in the race, is just turn off the headlights in the PLR file. And um, your car will still show the headlights for the other drivers, but you won't see headlights and your frame rate will be better. So hopefully we have more finishers next time. 
Fingers yeah. crossed. Fingers crossed. Otherwise, a great race, in my opinion. Um, World Racing was was really strong once again, but they weren't dominant at all. Uh, they were under pressure from uh, from Ely and from Torborg. And it was good to see. It was really exciting with the three different teams battling for the podium positions. Certainly makes again it just proves the diversity of uh, and quality of drivers and teams that we have in TPS. Of course, it's nice to see a nice spread across the field. It certainly made uh, much of an impact going forwards. But um, of course, we now move on across to the second qualifying session with about 12 seconds left to go before they uh, get sh get shown the green lights and cars are already making their way out onto pit road as uh, Matteo Orban that's quite cheeky that most of them are going out while the uh, lights are still red which is uh, what I thought was frowned upon in TPS circles but fair enough they're still going out nonetheless first few cars out Andy van der Vel sweeps through the shot followed by looks to be Chris Shepard is that Chris Shepard? I think it might be or it could be, if I'm very much mistaken, and I could be. Uh, it is Chris Shepard. Chris Shepard and Matty Orban also going out as well. Also, I saw, I think that was possibly Chris Butcher as well on track. Also, so cars are filtering out now for the second qualifying session. And, well, when it comes to, comes to these kind of race weekends where you have two qualifying sessions, is, is, is there anything that you can take forwards in the second qualifying session that, like, lessons learned from first qualifying session at all. I mean, what is it when you go into a second qualifying session? I mean, because you've had a race, it, does it give, make you more prepared for this quali for, for qualifying for a single lap run? Does it give you more confidence because you've had such a successful run in race one? Or if you've had troubles in the first race, does it kind of, does it fire you up to do better? What goes through, What from a mental point of view, how do some drivers approach the second qualifying session? Is there any difference between how they approach the second one compared to the first one of the evening? I'm not sure about the mental point of view. Of course, it, it will help you when you had a good first race, and then you're 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 feeling more happy and confident. But I think the bigger problem is that it's not a mental problem actually. It's the problem that you drove the first race, and at the end of the first race, you've been driving on worn tires. And now you come into the qualifying session again, and you have much more grip available from the tires, and you can't really use that immediately. That's what we see very often. So it's actually quite difficult to go into the second qualifying session, and very often we see slower times in it. And usually the second qualifying session does throw up one or two surprises. It has been known to be quite a regular thing in TPS when it comes to the series, which have uh, two qualifying sessions on one weekend. And uh, possibly we could be seeing surprises once more. So cars are now starting their flying laps, the first flying laps of the session. We're already now two minutes deep into this 10 minute session. And uh, is there anyone possibly that could be a, a surprise or a standout in qualifying t in the second qualifying session here that maybe wasn't exactly on the pace in, in qualifying one, but maybe their confidence may have been boosted by a good result or some good form in the first race that maybe they could carry forwards into this session? Yeah, I think that could be the case for Jimmy Hughes because he had a pretty good uh, finishing position. I think he was 10th in the first race and he started outside the top 20 for the first one. So he's definitely got better pace and yeah, maybe he can do it this time in the qualifying session. Here is Jimmy Hughes, of course, finished in uh, 11th place in race one after starting at the back of the grid. So a very valiant effort for him to start charging up through the order in order to uh, just finish outside. the. I think he actually deep, I think he might have been finished in, inside the top 10 in 10th position, I think. So a uh, good run from Jimmy to take advantage of other drivers losing their head while he kept his. And he currently makes his way down the back straight. There are both uh, Ryan Callan. I think it was Goose Verve oh, Goose Verve, sorry. Tolborg. <laughs> it's a Tolborg and Verve. I always get confused because both Callan and Verve have got the same numbers, but just the other way around. So it's kind of just, and they're all on the same team. So I can never tell who's uh, 68 and who's 86, but it is Callan is 68 and Goose Verve 86. And of course, uh, the sponsorship on the side of uh, the Mad Kate team is Rapid Switch. Shout out to them, of course, for Mad Kate Racing. Very valuable sponsor for the team. It's one that they want to try and impress going forward. And hopefully, they will have been impressed by the form that Jimmy showed. We are starting to get a couple of times in from some of the big guns. And already, you can see, we've got times in from the likes of Talborg and Campfield and Matty Orban and Chris Shepard and Paul Crawford. So, it's Jesper Talborg then. Currently setting the pace as Paul Patrick pumps in a 152.318. Jesper Talborg, uh, Rob, as well, I say that, Tom Ely's gone to quickest once again. 152.127. So, certainly, Rob, he's not hanging around. Quickest getting his first fast lap in and bang, straight to the top of the times. Yes, I mean that 
that isn't the ultimate pace. That time won't be pole position, I'm pretty sure, but it's a very, very good bank lap. Even though if you have a power card or if you mess up every lap that follows, it will still be in the top 10 with, with this time. That's that's good from Ely, but now we see Camfield. He's uh, a lot quicker out of the first sector already. And of course, these guys, they've got the potential to set times like a 51.6. I think pole time in the last race was a 51.8 only, but uh, yeah, maybe they can even improve in this session. Paul Patrick is currently up by a tenth as he's now going to get benefit from uh, two of his teammates. And it's of course, I think, being Adrian Campfield and also... Oh, it's Nearing and um, oh, it's Nearing. Back. I need to learn all these numbers all these walk racing cars because they all look the same. It's kind of just whose numbers what. Like, it's very confusing. They've got different mirror colours as well. Nearing's in the one with the yellow mirrors, Hanneberg with the green, Patrick with the uh, pink mirrors and Campfield with the blue mirrors. So that's how I can tell them apart. <laughs> in, many ways, in many ways, of course, when it comes to, to a league contact, it's kind of they all kind of look the same. So you just try and differentiate from the, from the names rather than the wing mirrors if you can. But usually, it's not a problem. Now, look, it's at also the, with the night, of course, and that the cars are black. In, absolutely, yeah, it makes it even more difficult. They almost kind of fade into the background. Just see kind of pairs of lights just filtering through the darkness. As uh, Paul Patrick currently now is in fourth place, Camp went up to third after his times. So he's now currently jumped up a little bit more. Now Patrick's on a quick lap at the moment. He's not exactly on a personal best, on a, a, a personal best, or at least um, a green time, a purple time. But he's only fourth quickest with that time. It doesn't improve. He's only fractions off his best. No, he's a full second off his best time. And Ely, I think, did he possibly improve with that time? He did, in fact. He did improve by by sixty five hundred uh, by six hundredths of a second. He now goes to a fifty six point zero six two. It's currently Ely and Tolborg on the front row. But Campfield is currently now going even quicker. But dropped to 11th after his first after his uh, next qualifying effort. Campfield finding time in Sector 1. And seeing as what he can get away with in that second sector. I also got uh, Purple Sector Source from Jesper Tolborg and Paul Patrick and Chris Shepard and Klaus Neering all in Sector 1. And a personal best for Ben Haxon, 16th as well. So uh, and, and Peter Hennenberg also. So And Tommy too. So uh, everyone's going purple, uh, Rob. And they seem, so it's, so it seems to be finding grip out there with three and a half minutes left to go. Yeah, I also think the first sector from Tom Ely isn't really that good. They're all up on, on his sector, but uh, yeah, there isn't really much time left, so now they already need to bring their quick lap times in. Oh, Campfield. Campfield's looking really strong here. Campfield is currently now up at two tenths per second, so there's a chart, real chance here. He could be the first one. Tobble going even quicker. Look at that by wow. only four tenths of a second. <laughs> He's really finding time out there, Jesper Tolborg. This has been a, a very, this, some hidden pace here from Tolborg. Not just think he's been sandbagging, but this is certainly a bit of a surprise here. Now, Ely is still up as well, so they're all purple. The first four, all purple on Ely's current pole time. Now, Campbell will surely go quickest, but surely Tolborg will go even quicker. Campbell will come across the line then. He does go top 52.031. He lost the time. Now you see what Tolborg does. He stays on the left side to get a faster time, and that's a brilliant time, 51.7. Brilliant lap from Jesper Tolborg to get himself, look at that, by almost three tenths per second. Ely, uh, Klaus Neering's on to fourth. Patrick goes to second. So, two movers there from Walk Racing, and Ely goes to third as well, but he improves on the 52.027. So, there were times changing all over the place. Chris Butcher's currently on a personal best for his lap time. Comes out of the final chicane. What can he improve to? He's got one of the Walk Racing cars behind. I think it's possibly Ryan Walker behind him, I think. As they head, he heads down the pit straight. He goes towards the pit wall as well. Across the line, it, he goes to sick. Now that's more like it from Chris Butcher. Into the top 10. He said he'd be happy with the top 10. So he certainly got on the right way there. Sixth quickest. He's about six tenths off the pole position time so far. That's certainly what he was looking for. As Patrick's going quicker still in second place. Up by a tenth on Tilebourg's time. So then again, it didn't seem as though... To oh, it's... Whoa! That was car 88 going almost up and over onto two wheels. Now... I'm trying to think who that was possibly. Was that, that was Klaus Nearing? That was Klaus Nearing. Sorry. Let's look at the, the quick replay of that one. So this is Klaus Nearing into chicane and oh, up and over. That's Tarquini style. BTCC nice 94. It's at Donington Park. Gets it up onto two weeks, and as Mario Walker would say, almost over. But he pretty good recovery. He hasn't really he lost much time from it. Very impressive. Maybe, maybe you can give Patrick a draft now because Patrick is right behind him on track. Oh, Patrick's lost a bit, but he's still close enough. There was just a super quick middle sector from Jesper Tolborg. 
I do wonder, possibly, if that was due to the fact that he had to possibly back out of it because he thought maybe that Sneering could have gone into trouble, which may have cost, 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 possibly cost him a bit of time in that second sector. That's the only thing I can think of that may have cost, caused him to lose that much time. But Chris Butcher's currently, once again, going quicker on a personal best. Campbell's up to second with his lap, 151.880. Butcher going faster still. One, currently a tenth and a half up on his, on his own personal best lap time. And that, I think, will put him into fifth position if he, if he can carry on with this pace. Hennenberg is into eighth with a 152.380. As we're less than 30 seconds away from the end of the qualifying session. Ryan Walker and Ryan Callan are both going quick as well. Uh, if we look at Ryan Walker, he's up as well. And also is Ryan Callan on a personal best two. Countful going quicker in sector one. Butch comes across the line and he does improve. He goes to fifth. So he gets himself a top five slot for the start of the race, which is good to see as the clock ticks down to zero now. So he's got one more chance to try and improve. Campbell, though, is currently on a flyer at the moment. Once again, see what he's got left in the tank as he heads through the complex of turn seven. And can he find any more time in the second sector? Walker up to Ryan Walker. Great job up to sixth place. For his lap time, 152.150, and Callan goes to 11th. As Otterkland is also improving, he's two tenths up in Sector 1. But that will possibly get him as oh. Campbell is still up. And that's after the second sector, and that was the real strong sector from Torbock. So Campbell has got a chance to take the pole position here, and that looks really clean as well. <laughs> but Talbot's going quicker in Sector 1 also. He's up by almost 31 thousandths of a second. So, And he got his he got his final lap time in just as the, I, th I believe at least, I think he did when the clock hit zero. So unless this lap is going to count or not, I'm not sure. It's the clock. The time is still going. So I'm guessing that Tarborg did oh, maybe just about getting in front. I'm a bit confused, but we'll have to wait yes. and see. And Cam now about to cross the line. Comes across, and he does go to pole. First oh. time in that final sector, 151.605. That's one of the quickest times we've seen across the weekend. So he goes top of the times. Now all to be seen, what has Tarborg got in response, if anything? And he's down by almost just over a quarter of a second. So possibly the answer is he has nothing left. So Catford and Tolbor could be the front row. It looks like it's going to be Patrick and Ely on row two. Uh, Butcher and Ryan Walker on row three. That's a great third row there. Improvements from their race one performance. Oscar didn't seem to improve at all. But he does. Oh. Right. I spoke too soon. <laughs> Seventh quickest for John Oscar. Great effort from, from Oscar to get himself up there into the top ten once again. As Nearing's 8th, Matty Auburn ninth, and Peter Hennenberg ran out of the top 10. And we're going to wait now, of course, for Talbot. To get... He's actually aborted that lap. He's, 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 he's not going to benefit at all from running a second lap. So he's going to come into the pits and resort himself to a front row slot. And so with that, we do have our grid for race number two of the evening. And it is Adrian Kampfer with his last lap of the last lap of the session. Take pole position, and he will start alongside Jesper Tolberg, who had pole for quite a while after that very impressive lap in the THR Red Machine. He will start on the front row. Paul Patrick is third ahead of Tommy, the man he started put on pole in race one, had to finish second in race in race one. Also, uh, Chris Butcher, much better pace he's shown in race one. He starts fifth ahead of Ryan Walker in sixth. Uh, whilst the session resets itself, Jordan Oscar at seventh, Klaus Nearing eighth. With Matthew Auburn ninth and Peter Hennenberg rounding out the top ten. With John Monroe, Ryan Callan, Chris Shepard, Gus Verver, Ben Haxon, Luis Fernandez, uh, Jimmy Hughes, Andy Vanderbilt, and Paul Crawford rounding out the and, and Tavi de Carvalho, I should say, rounding out the top twenty. We'll be back in just a moment. We're going to take another quick break to give another shout out to our friends at Inside Sim Racing. So stay tuned. We'll be back with all the action from race two here at Zolder. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. Welcome back to the live race action here for round two of the Virtual Mini Challenge for Touring Pro Series for season of 2014. 
And of course, at once again, if you want to keep it up to date with everything that we're doing, be sure to get in contact any way you can. Just let us know by the website, touringproseries.com, for all the information, including, of course, um, our very prestigious t um, TPS Hall of Fame and, of course, the TPS ranking system, where you can see exactly who is the best and worst of TPS and who, of course, who made it to the Hall of Fame, who is the greatest of past and present championships currently still running in the series. Also, facebook.com forward slash Touring Pro Series. Give us a like on there to see some fantastic photos from our good friend Jesper Tolbor, who puts in some fantastic renders of some of the championship races that we see in some of the liveries that uh, run around here in the championship. He puts on some fantastic stuff. Uh, and, of course, you can follow us on Twitter as well. Give us a tweet at Touring underscore Pro, or the direct link is twitter.com forward slash Touring underscore Pro. And if you miss any of the action from this or any TPS race broadcast that we run, then be sure to hit up youtube.com forward slash Touring Pro Series. Hit the subscribe button. It takes two seconds and it is free. And of course, you get kept up to date with every single broadcast that we do, which means you'll never miss a TPS race weekend at all for the life that you're subscribed as well. And also another shout out to remind you as well, on next Monday, the next round of the Virtual Clear Series, once again here at Zolder, as of course the two championships across the summer, both Clio's and Minis are both sharing a calendar. They will, of course, be appearing. It's the turn of the Clio's to strut their stuff under the lights of Zolder. And that will be on Bank Holiday Monday this coming week, just after this, just, just after this coming weekend. So, uh, like I said, next Monday, if you want to, want to see exactly what, to find something to do on your Bank Holiday Monday evening, then, of course, tune in with us at Touring Pro Series to watch some top-quality virtual tin top action with the Clio's. So, moving into just the end of warm-up session with, of Race 2 with about just over a minute to go. And, Rob... Any surprises from qualifying that you took away from there? Because, again, it seems to be once more. Those drivers that struggled a little bit in race one, both for qualifying pace and race pace, they do seem to come back with a vengeance for, for race two, and they showed it already in qualifying. I mean, the likes of Chris Butcher and Ryan Walker, Jov and Oscar Clint as well, these guys really have shown their, shown their true colours in this second session, especially Chris Butcher. We spoke to him and said that he was possibly um, not hoping for a better pace. He certainly seems to have found it because he's up there in the top five. Yeah, that's uh, back to normal for Chris Butcher, I would say. Um, I don't know how he did that, you know, <laughs> how he found this pace so so quickly, but he's certainly back uh, at the front, and it could be exciting to see what he can do. And Walker and Ockerklin right behind him, and with Ockerklin you could say it's a surprise, but I wouldn't really say that anymore, because he's now been consistently near the front in the minis over the last races. You could already see it last season at, um, I think it was at Campo Grande, where he got a fifth place finish. So he's uh, certainly one of the front runners now in this league. Yeah, Ryan Walker um, doesn't have so much experience in the minis and in front wheel drives in general, but he's doing well as well. So good to see. Certainly is, and also we can see, of course, John Monroe's back up in 11th spot, so he's found a little bit more pace overall. Seems to be that really the only THR driver that seems to be benefiting from any kind of real raw pace for the chance of challenging for a victory, at least a podium. With all due respect, there seems to be Esper Tolborgas. We get treated to a bit of a drift drift display there from Tom Lee. Getting the handbrake out to uh, we warm up the rear tyres and put on a bit of a show. As the clock has ticked down to zero, which means we are ready to go to the grid for the second race of the evening here at Zolder. And of course the cool conditions will still mean that uh, tyre temperatures are going to be something that's going to be prominent in the minds of everyone going forwards. Campfield has a great chance here from pole position. He can get himself a good start to once again go forward to take his third victory from four races. It means that he can currently have a nice comfortable lead in the championship over his teammate. But it certainly seems as though, Rob, that uh, Jesper Tolborg stepped up his pace with that awesome lap before Campfield topped it with his, with his final fly in the session. So Tolborg looks as though he's a bit more menacing. He certainly was at the end of lap range of race one. He'll be looking to carry that on going forwards into the second race, won't he? Yeah, yes, but he was. Uh, usually, he's quite famous for being very careful at the start of the race and, um, you know, taking it easy and not going for every move. But at the end of the race, he was certainly going for the move there for the podium. And yeah, now he's got a better qualifying position. We could see in the first race that Canfield was struggling a little bit at the start of the race, so he needed a few laps until his tires were up to temperature and he could really attack. Edie was pulling away in the first laps. So that would be interesting to see if Jesper can maybe capitalize already on the start. So, as the cars then head through under the lights, what a fantastic shot that is. Underneath the spotlights here at Zolder as the cars pierce the darkness, their lights ablaze. 
Force them out the front of the grid. If we run through it, then for race number two is Adrian Campfield for Rourke Racing. He will start on pole alongside Jesper Tolborg in second place. Then Paul Patrick, third for Walk Racing. Ahead of Tom Ely, the man who started on pole for race one. Then again, led for most of the right, but then unfortunately was pipped by Adrian Campfield in the last few laps, despite a couple of valiant efforts to try and reclaim uh, the race, race lead. And he's looking possibly for his second ever career TPS victory. Chris Butcher, back on form with pace. Up to fifth, ahead of a very strong show from Ryan Walker. Great stuff from Optimum Sim Racing. He was actually the fastest car of Optimum. He starts sixth, ahead of his Jonathan Osclint in seventh. Uh, class nearing in eighth. And running off a really awesome effort in the top ten for Optimum Sim Racing. Jamati Orban in ninth, with three of their cars in the top ten. Brilliant show from Optimum. They've got to be incredibly happy with that performance. And Peter Hennenberg rounds out the top ten. And as I let uh, Rob take over the rest of the field, it's John Monroe in 11th quickest, ahead of Ryan Cannell in 12th. Chris Shepard 13th and Chris Verver in 14th for Walk Racing. So then we've got in 15th place Ben Hackerson in the final Optimum Sim Racing car, followed by Luis Fernandez, the only driver of uh, GT Competizione this time. Jimmy Hughes, unfortunately, only in 17th. He couldn't really <laughs> follow my advice of doing a brilliant uh, second qualifying session. Ahead of Andy van der Felde, who also had a pretty good first race, I think. 19th place for Paul Crawford, then 20th, Xavier de Cavallo. And on the last row, Stefan Kosubek and Marcelo Tocco from the TK Racing Team. And unfortunately, we're missing Andrew Waring and Oscar Hartwig in this race. The two puppy racing drivers are still experiencing some frame rate issues with their, their rigs. So unfortunately, they will not be taking part in this race. And that is a shame because that's two very prominent drivers who were definitely capable, in our minds at least, to secure a top 10 finish. There is uh, Campbell, who's very eager to get onto the front of the grid because he certainly pulled quite a gap. Uh, to the rest of the pack and he's certainly going to be waiting on the, uh, the front row for quite a while and that could affect his tyre temperatures if he's not too careful yes but Tolbog slotting into place behind in second place then as the rest of the field begins to form up um, and do it last few burnouts as somebody is that uh, Luis Fernandez in the pit lane it seems though he's up, he's gone skating through his spots but he could be starting from the pit lane I'm not sure what the issue could be but again we get set for another 16 laps and under the lights at Zolder Campfield and Tolbog on the front row how will it play out this time revs are up waiting for the start Lights are out, and we're racing once again. Decent start for Campbell to move across, but Tolbog's kind of gone with him. And a great start from Ely also, he's jumped up through the field as well, as they head down towards turn one for the first time. And, into, and through they go, Campbell would have the run, or will he? Because Tolbog's in the triangle with him round the outside. And Campbell has to give him room, because there's a bit of contact. And Tolbog slots in behind to second place, so Campbell leads. Tolbog second, Patrick and Ely swap places back for third and fourth. With Butcher having a great start up to fifth, he's come up the inside of Ely already. His former teammates at THR and Butch Butcher with a much better getaway this time, much better luck. And I have to again settle for fifth for the moment, ahead of Ryan Walker in sixth, Oscar in seventh, nearing eighth. Then it's Matty Orban and Peter Hennenberg rounding out the top ten. So for the most part, Rob, the top ten stayed single file, but they're all going side by side down towards the chicane here. Yeah, Tormok on the outside now. Can he make a move here? Yeah, it's very tricky in this car. He can't make a move, but oh, Camfield almost got into the into the tires and Camfield, Camfield is squeezing Torvald. Whenever Torvald gets an overlap, Camfield is squeezing him and Patrick now gets past Torvald. Now what happened there with uh, Matty Orban and Ryan and Ryan Walt and Ryan Callow, I believe, because there was a little bit of a... That, uh, that certainly cut the chicane, so I'm not sure there was a bit of contact between the pair of them. But uh, that's quite intriguing. And also whilst you watch, look at that, Paul Patrick has got past Torvald. And I wonder, because I did notice that Torvald ran wide on the exit of the chicane, first chicane at least. And that just possibly allowed Patrick to pull up alongside and make a move into the Turn 7 complex. Oh, and Patrick. Patrick! Patrick just darting around to the inside of his teammate, can't get the job done as he holds defensive, but he has forced him wide a little bit on the exit of the corner, which may give Patrick the run he might need to pull alongside him, and here he comes. So already the two walk racing cars are going side by side, and Tarbell could make it three wide down towards the Jackie X chicane, as behind Butcher swarming around the back of Ely's to come under brakes for the Jackie X chicane for the first time. Look at the top five, the snake they've got, and it's close. It's a seven-car train. Look at this. Catfield, Patrick, Palborg, Ely, Butcher, Walker, and Osserklin all together. With Matthew Orban in there as well. He's ahead of class nearing, and Ryan Callan rounds up the top ten. Then Monroe in 11th, Chris Shepard 12th, Paul Crawford up to 13th. What a start from him. And so did Carvalho 14th, but also Jimmy Hughes up to 15th. Peter Hennenberg has dropped way down to 16th place in, in the field so far after some possibly some shenanigans on the first lap. We've lost Lewis Fernandez, who was darting into the pit, so possibly uh, a frame rate issue for him. Also, maybe, possibly, I'm guessing. Gus Verver down back in 17th. He's had a poor start also. Then Ben Haxon. 
Stefan Kosebeck and Marcel Toko. And Andy van der Velde has also dropped back as well. He's had some problems on the first lap. But so far, Rob, the top is starting to break away as it was before. And Tarbourg, after losing a place to Patrick, he's got some work to do. Yeah, it looked a bit weird how Patrick got past Torvog because I had the impression that Torvog actually had an overlap on Camfield, was trying to go um, on the outside out of this corner, and then Camfield just moved over and gave him no room. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure, not sure what to think about that, but Torvog certainly not wasting any time. He's trying to go around the outside now of Patrick. Oh, contact again. Very close, but of course, two cars don't really fit through this sh these chicanes alongside. So it's, uh, it's always a great risk if you try to make a move there. And, and Butch has got around Ely as well, so he's up into fourth. So Butch now has, a, has free reign to start chasing off the Tolborg, and that's exactly what Tolborg needs. He should see him in his mirrors and think, that's fantastic, I've got a teammate now that possibly could be on the pace. He's going to start chasing afterwards, but you might not have that luxury for long, because he's going to come back at him on the exit of turn eight. Now, I'm not sure if there was contact, or if at least Butcher forced him deep into the corner, but he's going side by side. And look at the pack of the, the trio of Optin Sim Racing Cars and Ryan, Ryan Cal also getting involved as well. Under brakes, is there, is there a bit of contact? I think there was. Oh, yeah. As you get sideways through the middle. Oh, oh Callum! Callum! My goodness, Callum went sideways through that corner. What happened to him? You can see a bit of a replay. We'll look at it in a second. As look at this, they're three wide. Here comes Ryan Walker. Look at him getting involved in this pack. He gets a slipstream from. Uh, Tom Ely to the outside of Chris Butcher. Can he sweep around the outside through the left hander? Not quite. He'll go. He, look at the cutback he gets. So that's a fantastic move from Ryan Walker if he can pull it off. And look at the seeding train behind him. They're so side by side and, and nose to tail all the way down the bottom of the top 10 and beyond. As Butcher walking that back up the inside again with a switch back. And Walker's got himself in front. Brilliant driving from the young Scotsman. He's now into fifth position and our top five now. Optum will be rubbing their hands back in the pit lane for that one. And also here could be here could possibly could come Matty Orban as well. So either Chris Butcher has been rattled by whatever happened to Tom Ely, or maybe he's just lost a bit of pace because possibly he just his momentum's gone possibly. But he's certainly stuck coming under attack as he comes back again up the inside, throws it into the chicane and back into fifth place. So Butcher's certainly getting a lot a little, a, quite defensive after his early mistakes. Yeah, you could see Butcher getting all sideways into the final corner there with uh, with Ely, and then Cullen came through flying through the through the chicane because he had one of the tires there. Oh, Cullen on the inside again. <laughs> that was a very messy corner, but somehow they all sorted themselves out and still racing. Here's the front bumper view then, looking forward to Ryan Cullen, just going to close in on Matty Orban. Up through the gears, back down towards turn 8, they're going to hit the brakes hard. And he jumps down the inside of Matty Orban. Oh! oh. Just lost his braking. That puts him straight into the side of, of Matty Orban. Now, I think the two of them were just last of the late breakers. Can we get Matt a replay has, of that? Yeah, we can, certainly. Let's have a look at that again. And so looking at it, now, it looks as me as though Ryan looks like he's full alongside. Oh, now that's... Oh, that, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, um, Orban Matt, is turning Matt in on him. Coming, though. To be but fair, I'm not, Matty, Matty I'm, should have seen that Ryan was up the inside. He probably should have seen that coming, really. It's, it's hard to say because we couldn't really see in where Ryan's car was positioned, if he was all on the apex or if he was running wide as well, because when he was running wide, there's nothing Obama could have done. But that's a bit of unfortunate conduct. I would probably say a racing incident, the way it looks now. Quite possibly, uh, but also we'll have to wait and see and possibly get the re reactions of both parties uh, after the race in the post-race uh, interviews. Back towards the front, Adrian Campbell, fastest lap of the race again, and he currently leads by all, up by eight tenths of a second from Paul Patrick and once again it's battle lines drawn between these two as it was in race one for third place now it's for a step higher on the podium for second place but Tolborg knows that uh, the race victory is possibly within touching distance provided he can keep pace with Campfield through these next few laps and possibly try and get around Patrick as soon as possible he's broken away from the chasing pack in fourth he finds himself in no man's land with Chris Butcher chasing after him for company now Walker's gone away in second. Look at this again. They're still going at it. Cal now at the inside of Shepard now, which will turn into the outside line for turn seven. Will he sweep across? No, he gives Shepard enough room and has to slot him back behind. It's almost a concertina effect as uh, Cal just, just slightly, lightly, lightly nudges the back of Shepard's car. And then in turn, that, that's Matty Orban just um, tap the rear bumper as well. They all close up again back towards turn eight and he's kind of going to make another last minute move down the inside he thinks better of it this time sure at least Matty Orban will applaud find also Peter Hennenberg is under attack from John Monroe and John very quiet weekend for John this one he's not exactly been 
uh, at, the, at the forefront of anyone's attention, which is a real shame because, of course, he's a very talented driver. Of course, he's a lot of real world commitments. I know he's also been racing uh, a single seater for real, of course, in the, I think, his father's uh, uh, single seater hill climb sprint car for Croft a couple of weeks ago. The reason why he wasn't around for the Clio's last week. And he, he actually won his class, I believe, so it's congratulations to John for that one. Of course, uh, ever since he got his, his, uh, his time to uh, uh, try a cart at Buckmore Park, of course, he's now progressed forwards and now going to have a chance. Speaking of chances, Orban trying to throw it back up the inside of Callan through, through turn three. The experienced Englishman, the TPS admin, of course, very uh, wise to that move and holds on for the moment at least to eighth position. So, leaders then back up towards the front. They're still close as they ever were. But for this point, for, now, for this point, what you can see, Rob, do you think that possibly Paul, he's not exactly challenging his teammate, of course, even though these two are, technically at the moment, battling for the championship. Is, does it seem as though that Paul's really playing more of a rear guard action? Is he playing more like a support role for Campo at the moment, for this race at least? Cause it seems as though that he doesn't seem to have the outright pace to challenge him for the victory. But he's certainly doing enough to keep Talborg at bay. And I think for the moment for Campfield, that is really enough for what he expects from his teammate. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that now because um, Patrick, he's, he's not really losing time to Campfield. So he's not driving overly defensive lines or anything. Not blocking Talborg at the moment. He's just driving his normal lines ahead of Talborg. Now he's lost a bit of time in that sector, but still it's not really dramatical. Talborg isn't really close to him anyway. But I think... Patrick can't really afford to drive like a teammate for Campfield too much in the season because these two guys are they are leading the championship and uh, Patrick has already lost ground in the first race to, to Campfield so um, even though they're teammates even though they're working together I'm pretty sure they both want to win the championship so um, I doubt that Patrick will really only drive as a teammate for uh, for Campfield and try to block Torwok here I think he wants a, he wants the victory as well of course, the, 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 the furthest thing from my mind, of course, was suggesting that Patrick was playing second fiddle. Of course, as I said, because these two are both equally skilled, and of course, they both deserve a fair shot at the championship. It just seemed to me as though that Camp would have the outright pace, and Patrick, even though he's able to keep with him, just didn't have that little bit extra in the car that enabled him to try and get one over on his teammate to try and make a move. And as you said, the right said they can't really afford to race like teammates; they have to race like rivals for the championship. But of course, there has to be enough. But there is a mutual respect between the pair of them, and they cannot afford to make a mistake or at least come to blows because of course that's the one golden rule in racing you do not hit your teammate or take them out in any shape or form I'm sure that uh, Sport Racing's team boss Mr C will have uh, certainly uh, drilled that into every single one of his drivers for this championship and of course also uh, going forward for the virtual clear series as well looking back now there's Tommy in fourth he's starting to pull a bit of a gap on Chris Butcher now almost three seconds Butcher seems comfortable-ish in fifth place, even though Ryan Walker is about a second back. Walker with another impressive run, and again, this is the two teammates swapping places. No, this is um, Shepard and Orban trying to swap places. Callan's also been shuffled back, as has Hennenberg and Munro and Neary. Look at this a six car, six car fight over seventh place. They're so tightly bunched together that just one slip up from any of them could cause disaster. The great scrap going on here is now possible. Let's see what's going to happen here. So, far takes it, Callan possibly going to try and make a move. He's, he's under attack from both. His teammate and also from John Munro. Oh, well, that was close. And Hennenberg also in there as well. So three walk racing cars getting involved also is uh, Paul Crawford in the background as well, making his presence felt in 13th place. What a great scrap this is. It seems to be though, Rob, that uh, the main battles are going on down near the rear end of the top 10 um, throughout this weekend, rather than up at the front. Well, uh, in the first race it also... Oh, oh car on two wheels, sorry. Sorry for that, Rob. I think it was possibly John Monroe. We're getting a replay of that because, again, someone else two-wheeling through the chicane. He's going to go side by side with Klaus Neary. But here's the replay again. And if we go from the view here, this is the chase camera. Oh, and you got a bit of a helping hand there from Klaus Neary. So, uh, very, very lucky boy indeed was John Monroe. And thankfully, you avoided that one if I flashed the headlights as well at Klaus Neary. Says, uh, thanks for that. I could have gone over that one, but uh, thanks for the tap on that one. Much appreciated. What I wanted to say is, um, also in the first race, we had the battles at the front of the field, but they were pretty late in the race. So um, at the moment, they're all just, you know, saving their tires, waiting for a good opportunity. And this, the guys in the midfield, they don't really care so much about that. They want to make up the ground, possibly get out of this group by the battling. But at the front, you know, they probably think they have a little bit more time and they don't need to attack now. 
looking back, we've got another battle going on here, and Ryan Callan certainly getting himself in the mix in this second race at least. He's going to throw it up the inside of Matty Albain once again. I was going to turn across again. There's a slight bit of body contact. That's now going to give Peter Hedenberg the chance to try and get around Matty as they head now through exit, exit the complex down towards the, uh, the main corner of turn eight. And uh, once again, Callan is through. Orban's now going to try and Lost him back behind, and here comes whoa! Here comes Hennenberg throwing it up the inside. Very oh, he had Callan. And there was oh well, no, 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 there was a bit of contact I think from behind from Klaus Nearing I think because I saw that Orban did get turned around slightly, but he managed to gather it up by giving it a boot full of throttle as you do with these front-wheel drive cars. And Orban's blood's going to be up because he won't appreciate that, and now he's going to come under attack again from this time from Klaus Nearing, the third Optum walk racing car in as many corners, and this now possibly gives John Moreover a chance to get back past as well. And he might get a bit of revenge as he did because he was passed on the exit of the final, cor final corner after he got, got on two wheels for clipping the tyres. So here comes Don Munro. Can't get a move done this time. He'll stay behind and hold on to 12th place for the moment. We can scoot back to the front. Let's have a look and see what's going on here then. So here are the leaders. And Campbell has been closed in by Patrick, so I was wrong. Either he's been listening or we'll certainly found a little bit of pace in that, uh, that machine because he has closed the gap up to less than two tenths of a second. And I wonder now if Patrick is going to make a move here. Of course, these two, of course, got to be sensible. Can't be too erratic with any kind of moves at all. And they both know, of course, fresh, it's fresh in their minds, of course. It's blatantly, blaringly obvious that Talborg will pick up the pieces if there is a mistake for either of these two. So really, Rob, between teammates, I'm sure as you and Chris have done before in the past, and if you've done with teammates before, in this situation when you've got two cars in the same team battling for the lead, but also one of your major team rivals behind in third place, you have to drive smart on this occasion. What we usually did is that we waited so long until we had a gap where, um, you know, we, we could battle a bit without getting caught by someone else, and then we battled. But we battled hard, so there was no like I never gave maybe except for the final race also when when it was already decided who could win the championship from the team. But otherwise, we never gave each other the win also because that's I don't know that's not really racing for me. I don't like that, and I'm pretty sure these two guys they don't like that either. Just giving up the win for for no reason. But of course, at the moment, they can't really do anything. They can't really battle so hard. Because, um, oh, well, that's kind of Torvald. Because Torvald is uh, way too close. So if they start to battle now, they don't even need to take each other out. They just need to make one move that's maybe not really careful enough, and Torvald might overtake one of them. And then they can't use any tactics anymore. So back towards the... Uh now on lap 960. Apologies for that small glitch on the screen. I'm not sure why that's come up on there, but um, thankfully we've managed to rectify that for you now. There was a small temporary little uh, box to come up on the screen, so thankfully that's not going to do anything else anymore. Uh, Campbell then currently holding on, and Patrick has just dropped back a little bit, which now means that uh, it's a chance for uh, Talbot to keep closing in in third position. Continuing on now, back in fourth place is still Tom Ely. And then, of course, now we're looking forwards. It's still uh, Chris Butcher in fifth, Wine Walker in sixth place. Now Chris Shepard seventh. The rest of that top is starting to spread out a bit more because Hennenberg has gone around Callan. So Shepard and uh, Walker have started to pull away a little bit. That now gives the opportunity to uh, Klaus Nearing. Oh, John someone Rose. crashed! Someone oh, crashed! I think it's Ryan Walker. Was that Ryan Walker? It was Ryan Walker. Oh, Ryan Walker, and that's that's a smoky engine. He's possibly going to hit the wall hard. And was that his? He clipped the tyres. I wonder. Possibly it could be a result of that. Let's have a look then. So looking on, looking from the TV view here, gets it turned in, and yeah, he's clipped the tyres. It's gone airborne and straight into the barriers, and that has totaled his engine. <laughs> and the car starts to probably turn upside down for a second, but. Uh, yeah, that's a real shame. Ryan was having such a great strong run. It was up to sixth place for him. He was having such a brilliant run in that OSR machine. But unfortunately, that is the end of his race. And that's a real... I'm really disappointed in that. I am really am actually quite sad for that because he was having such a great run at that point. And uh, that really hasn't worked out for him now. Is that an Optus racing car in the back of the field? Now, who's that? That is... I think it's Jonathan Ockerklin. He dropped, Os Os dropped back so... very early. Oh, okay. And we lost also St um, Stefan Kosebeck as well for suspension, with suspension problems. So that has pos that unfortunately happened also. Uh, as we look back towards the front of the field, then, if you have a look. What, what has to be said is that Adrian Campfield is setting great lap times, lap after lap. So he's he's not going easy at all, he's just pushing very hard and um, 
it seems like Patrick, even though he had to draft before, he couldn't really follow him so much. So at, at the moment, with these lap times from Camfield, I don't really think there's any tactics involved or so, it's just that Camfield is doing a brilliant job at the times. And that also shows why Torbock couldn't really make any moves, because they are just, you know, they are just running quality pace. Yeah, the championship standings for a second. <laughs> Apologies for that one. Uh, moving forwards then, so... An intriguing run so far. As we head on to lap, we're now on lap 10 of 16 here. And the top three still close as ever. Uh, it's intriguing though that... Uh, yeah, so where I wanted to so I can keep shuffling through the positions. Um, that uh, Ely has now... I think Butch has started to turn the pace up a little bit now because he's got the gap down to two points. No, it's less than that. In fact, it's one point seven seconds now. So Butch is finding a bit more pace. So possibly, just he's, he must have really used race one as more of a well-publicized test session to get a bit more bedding into the setup and find things before he had uh, before he retired. But um, certainly, it's good to see that Chris Butcher back up to speed. So possibly, just was, was it just as you said, was it just lack of preparation for him and lack of running that maybe could have compromised him for race one? And do you think that off the back of that, he's found a little bit some suitable pace now for race two? Do you think that uh, he's certainly showing it now in race two because he's up there in fifth position and start to close in bit by bit on Tom Ely for fourth place? Yeah, I mean, certainly Chris Butcher is one of the best drivers in these cars that we've seen at TPS. He's the guy who's got the most wins in this particular car, in this particular league. And uh, yeah, it was quite unusual to see him so far off the pace, so um, yeah, certainly he's uh, he's found something. Maybe he's used to set up from Torvok this time, I'm not sure, maybe they've been running different setups, different tire pressures or so. But he seems to be very, very comfortable in his car now. And he's not that far away from Tom Ely, so maybe he can make a move. Ely seems to be struggling. And that's also very unusual for Tom Ely to see him struggling with tire, with tire wear, because usually he's really good with, on the tires. Lap 11 and 16, that is, well, apologies for that again, I think there's some problems with my mouse cursor there again, I do apologise that uh, some random boxes are coming up there to uh, cause distraction. But we continue now, looking at Chris Butcher, who's got the gap down to about six tenths of a second, so Butcher seems to have found some pace from some, no, it's down to 1.4, sorry, I do apologise. Butch is finding pace from somewhere, and I wouldn't bet against him possibly going ahead and changing, the position changing hands uh, before the end of the race. So we'll have to wait and see exactly how that goes and plays out as we continue to watch how that battle shapes up. Now it does seem to me that Paul, that Paul Patrick in front has closed in once again to his teammate. He's finding a turn of pace in the middle part of this race. And is certainly putting the pressure onto his teammate once again. And he's done this a couple of laps ago wasn't really able to make that the much of the impact that he was possibly hoping to but uh, this is quite intriguing and the top five really have pulled away from the rest of the pack because there's a lot of battle going on battles going on down the back of the field as it is really close in fact what we'll do we'll stay with this battle for just a moment down the pit straight because possibly because Paul Patrick is very close to the back of Adrian Campbell but there's a, a huge scrap once again going on down the bottom end of the top ten if you look at the gaps uh, on the bottom, bottom of your screen, you can see Callan is just ahead of uh, Klaus Nearing, Jimmy Hughes, Matty Orban and uh, John Monroe, and they're all incredibly close together, so we're going to jump to that now, see exactly what's going on. Now, Callan has pulled away slightly, but it's this scrap we're looking at, of course, it's between Nearing, Hughes and Matty Orban, and John Monroe also looking to try and make, get himself back up into uh, 11th place. He's going to go to the outside of Matty Orban, and Matty's just about giving him room up against the pit wall. A bit rude of him to squeeze him up like that, but John uh, sees sense and actually moves out and thinks, okay, I'll be back to love it to fight another day, I'm not going to push it too hard. Now, also impressive, if you look behind, is that Paul Crawford, the independent, has got a bike. Oh. That's it, I spoke too soon because Gus was... Ferber got into the back of him. Now, that was a bit uncalled for from Gus, but then again, he might, might not have expected Paul to break as early as he might have done because, of course, he is an independent. He's not usually up in 13th place, or due respect to Paul, but certainly having a great run so far, and Gus almost spoiled it for him. Yeah, Gus Verver, he's a bit further back than usual, so I'm not sure what happened there for him. We see ahead, that's Hughes getting past or run, that's a clean move. Jimmy Hughes, once again, brilliant race for him. Doesn't have to grade poly, uh, qualifying. Back up through the field again, from when he started outside the top 10. And John, now what's happened to John Monroe? John Monroe has dropped to 15. Now what's the reason for that then? Let's have a look. Oh, oh. He tires again! Oh, and he's lucky to continue. Oh, Johnny boy, what have you done? He's lost three places now to Crawford, Verver, and Vanderveld. Hopefully, it doesn't have any damage from that, but 
like any big damage, but remains to be seen. Meanwhile, at the front of the field, Camfield and Patrick have completely dropped Tallborg. Have a quick look as we cycle through quickly. Apologies for the quick cycle through. And you're right, they have done. Look at that. So, Camfield and Patrick working together has got the gap up now to just about two seconds between the leader. Well, but that, the gap is now almost two seconds between Patrick and Tallborg, but it's now over two seconds between Camfield and Tallborg. So, 2.2 seconds separates first to third. And oh. also behind a notice, looking fourth place. Ely has again been steadily, steadily caught by Chris Butcher. And now on lap 13 of 16, Butcher can possibly sense a fourth place here if he's not too, if uh, Ely's not too careful. Yeah, I think Butcher has been running consistent lap times the whole whole time through. While Ely has been dropping back a bit, so I think Butcher will be there pretty soon. And at the front of the field, this is now the gap that Camfield and Patrick need so that they can battle without risking too much. So I'm I'm very curious um, if Patrick can actually attack Camfield or if they try to go over the line of formation here. These two, they've certainly made clear that these two are the, the quickest driver in the league so far, so I would I would appreciate it if they battled for the win. You almost hope it would be like Mercedes-type tactics, obviously as Hamilton and Rosberg are allowed to fight, of course, then uh, we can at least let Campwood and Patrick do exactly the same, and because they've now pulled the gap to um, just over two seconds, but he's dropped again because Tolborg realised that he's dropping back and he's picked his pace up again, because the gap's down to 2.1. Uh, John One Road, looking I saw, has just recovered and got around Zoe Di Carvalho for the, the Gus Verve. In fact, he's got around. So what's up with the Gus Verve? Gus Verve's dropped back, um, and he has, has he possibly hit the tyres again, as so, as so many drivers have throughout the race weekend. But uh, see here. So again, yeah, Tobol just doesn't seem to have enough, enough of an answer to these two because he's been dropped once again. Across the line they come. What's the gap this time? It's 2.1 to 2.3, so a further two tenths lost. So I think now we could be starting to see DC starting to scrap for the race victory because Patrick certainly wants Campbell to get a move on. And he's certainly giving him the, the signal to. And as they head through turns two and three, I'll say he tried giving the signals to uh, say, well, come on, Adrian. We are a couple of seconds ahead of Tolborg. See if we can actually fight about this and uh, see who's going to come out on top of this race weekend at least. So Patrick will be thinking, well, you've had one race, one, one race victory this, this weekend. I'd like to possibly make it make it two all so far in the championship, and Patrick is moving around a little bit. Then you're thinking about it. If he can hold his breaking point, is he going to be? Oh, is he going to be careful? He's literally pushing Campbell through the chicane. These two, of course, the longer they stay nose to tail, of course, the the massive hole of air they're going to be punching through. My hole they're punching through the air, so they're going to help them out to so pull away even further. Turn seven chicane, and still. Patrick is holding on to the back end of, of uh, Adrian Campbell here. And I wonder if the shackles have been released from both of these guys and they are free to race. And we'll see that Patrick possibly thinking about maybe lining up Campbell for a pass. He was certainly close enough. Come on, pal, you've got to try and make a move this time. And no, he seems to sit back. And this is... and Is this disappointing? Do you think this is possibly the case that really Paul Adrian should be fighting? I mean, even Camp Talbot, granted, he's just over two seconds away, but... Patrick just seems to be sitting back and just not bothering to fight. I mean, it's a bit disappointing to see this, Rob. I mean, well, maybe they're waiting to, to make a move. But on the other hand, I mean, at, at this rate, it looks pretty clear that they will win the race. So, I mean, they can win the race in this fashion and just drive over the line in, in formation. And, you know, <laughs> it's a disappointing, it's a, it's a boring race, maybe, for the, for the win, even though we had great battles in the midfield. Or they can decide to battle and, you know, they still finish 1 2, but it's much more exciting. and also for Paul Patrick, I don't know if he if he's not he's so close and if he's not attacking Camfield now, when when will he ever do that? Or is he just you know is he just supposed to be in the league to be the rear gunner to be the number two? I can't really imagine that. So I'm, I'm if they don't battle, I don't understand that. That's a, you know they've got such a big gap they have to battle now, especially when they want to in the championship. There's no excuse in my opinion. No, I have to agree. There's the, it, it does take away from the show the fact that Patrick is close enough. He has got the uh, enough pace to try and get around Campfield here. And surely there has to be a sequence here where they can at least, you know, it'd be allowed to swap places clean enough if they're, they're going to fight for the lead. But there has to be a possible opportunity because Patrick has literally been hit, uh, tapping the rear bumper of Campfield for the past lap or so. As just to give him a signal to say, well, come on, I want to get past you. But unfortunately, unless t uh, surely team orders cannot be holding them back. 
if they're up this this stage, and that, in my opinion, is quite frankly ridiculous. I don't think that is probably the case, but some people, some people I know, will have that mentality and think that possibly there is what there is what's going on. We should never presume before we actually know the real facts, because we can ask both Adrian and Paul exactly what the plan was and why it was possibly that Paul is not attacking Adrian at this point, whether or not it was formation finish. Formation finish. Maybe they know the fact that yes, even though it is not exactly isn't exactly the most exciting racing, it is the safest way to retain first and second and to maintain the gap and the advantage over Talborg. Now I have also noticed meanwhile whilst we've been watching this that uh, Chris Butcher's dropped back and actually here he comes in. Paul Patrick might look to the inside now finally for Campfield and finally it may be, they may have stood over the radio right last lap boys you are free to fight for the race victory. Now it's on. Now, we've, now we're going to turn up the heat. We've got one more Toro Zolder to go and it's going to be gloves off. Campfield versus Patrick for the victory I wonder. So down the pit straight here they come. Campfield yeah. leaves the door open. Yeah, <laughs> they'll be fired. He's going to go to the outside this time, and he's sideways on the brakes, trying to go around the outside. Campbell's going to give him enough room across the curbs. And they know, of course, they've got to fight, but they've got to do it cleanly. And they cannot afford to make contact or have any silly moves here, because they know that if one false move from any of them will happily give Talborg the advantage. And now, pa I was... Go on. And Patrick should remember how Talborg got past him. And that was in the final corner, so maybe he should just, you know, try to unsettle Camfield a bit now, try to maybe force him to mistake. But when he goes for a real move, for a real committed move, he should wait for the final corner. Now he should just make him a little bit nervous if he wants to have this race win. And the brakes for the chicane. Very tricky left and right, watch that clip the tyres. Perfect line for both of them. Up over the, over the, over the crest, underneath the bridge. Towards the turn seven complex. Is Paul Patrick going to have a chance here to dive up the inside of his teammate? No. He will stay behind in the braking. Possibly trying to try and force Campbell to outbreak himself and to possibly go straight on, but it hasn't happened this time. But it looks as though first and second could be set unless Paul Patrick's got any more tactics up his sleeve. He's got two more chances to get past here. Turn eight and then the chicane. What can he do here? Will he get even closer under brakes? He does. Oh, maybe he gets a good run here because. Canfield had to go defensive into the corner. Yeah, he's got a pretty good run over the corner. So now, if he wants to ha have the position, he needs to he needs to make a forceful move here. Here they come then. Last chance for Paul Patrick. Campbell going defensive. Patrick's going to go to the outside this time. And Campbell does move across and doesn't squeeze him, but he does give him enough room. Maybe he might, he might get the better exit on the of the corner onto the pit straight. I think it might just be all over. And Campbell is going to take his third race victory out of four in the season. Patrick pushed him hard to the end, but it's going to be too late. 1-2 for Walk Racing. Campbell wins from Patrick by one-tenth of a second. Talborg, uh, third, a further two seconds back. Fourth for Tom Ely. You know, I'm sure we will play somewhat. And Chris Butcher, what caused him to drop back in the final three? That's he was right on the tail, but it ends up some 2.7 seconds off the pace. No, it's like more than that, in fact. It's um, 3.7, in fact. Uh, Chris Butcher, Chris Shepard, sixth place. Got to be happy with that for Puppy Racing. With Hennenberg 7th, Ryan Callan holding off his teammate Klaus Nearing in 8th, so uh, uh, look at that, in 5 walk racing cars in the top 10. With uh, Matty Orban just holding off Jimmy Hughes for 10th position, Andy van der Velde 12th. Then we've got Paul Crawford 13th, just holding off John Monroe, just about across the line by 2 tenths of a second. Then Gustav Verver dropping to 15th, with having Dear Carvalho in 16th spot. And then we've got the rest of the cars coming through. Jordan Osseklin sands a front bumper. And then we've got, of course, the two TK Racing cars also with uh, who that is in number two. Is that, is that Matty? Or, no, it's not Matty. That's or Ben Hackerson. Ben Hackerson, so he's had some problems it during this race, but he'll come through in 19th spot. And again, only 19 cars due to finish the race. But uh, some faster frantic action once again in the second race weekend in the court, second race of the evening. And the victory and 1-2 goes to Walk Racing with Campfield ahead of Patrick and Talborg. With Tom Ely and Chris Butcher rounding out the top five. We are going to take a very short break of course come back with all the driver interviews and all of the analysis here from the two races and have a chat to the main protagonists of the evening but after a quick word from our friends over at inside sim racing so stick with us we'll be back in just two minutes inside sim racing.tv the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week.
Welcome back to the live coverage and the post-race interviews here for round two of the uh, 2014 Virtual Mini Challenge, hosted by Touring Pro Series here under the lights at Zolder for the night races. And it's been a double victory for Adrian Campfield, of course. He takes both victories and we'll talk to him and the rest of the podium places if we can uh, in just a few moments. Of course, just a quick reminder, again, that if you want to keep up to date with everything on the website, it is touringproseries.com to keep up to date with all the latest info. Also, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash touringproseries, or follow us on Twitter. We are at touring underscore pro, or the direct link is twitter.com forward slash touring underscore pro. And if you missed anything in this broadcast at all, or any broadcast that we've done either... Um, we've done so far uh, on our channel of course and you can go ahead and head to youtube.com forward slash touring pro series every single broadcast that we do going forwards and that we've done in recent championships will all be up there for you to watch at your leisure and of course we've got uh, the racing coming up next week we'll talk about that in a in a few minutes time but of course before then we're gonna have a chat to our so our drivers will be once again invaded in the commentary box by plethora of drivers i'm sure a lot a few more will start to come up to have a chat with us at some point but first of all, we're going to start by talking to the man who took both race victories and pole position in race two this night, and he was Adrian Campfield. Adrian, congratulations, two race victories and a pole position. Almost a perfect night for you, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I'm really happy with that. Um, and Paul, once again, showed great pace, so uh, it's looking good for walk racing this season so far. Of course, race one, of course, you started on the front row behind Tom Ely, and for most of the race, you were kind of just putting the pressure on. Um, but you decided to make your move in the last few laps. Now, of course, and it looked like a bit of a, a difficult effort to try and keep Tom behind. Just talk us through those last few laps, obviously, when you were defending from Tom and how hard it was to keep him behind. Yeah, well, in, in qualifying one and race one, I had massive lag the whole race. So that's why, obviously, my pace in qualifying one wasn't like it was in qualifying two. Um, and in race one, I had the same lag all race, and then towards the end, it started to clear. Um, but yeah, I was really surprised by Tom's pace. Um, it was good, because I thought it would be me and Paul at the front, and then to have Tom up there, I really struggled to catch him. Um, so yeah, it was quite hard to be honest, but I'm really happy that I uh, got both wins. And of course, race two, there was the battle that you had for the most part. You were obviously keeping both your teammate Paul Patrick and Jesper Tolborg at bay. Um, just talk us through what happened in the last couple of laps with back on your tail. I mean, obviously we'll get um, Paul's perspective on it as well. But I mean, it didn't it didn't seem as though you guys were allowed to fight until the last couple of laps. I mean, was that the case? Was that the arrangement that you had, of course? Or was it just simply a case of a mutual agreement that we'll keep in team formation and, of course, but as long as Tolbox is a sensible gap behind, then we'll start to battle. What what was the situation there that you had between yourself and Paul? Well, we knew uh, Tolbox was two, two and a half seconds behind. So if we battled any earlier, then he would have caught us straight away. So we said on the last lap, all right, well, let's have a battle and we'll see what we can do. Um, yeah, and apart from that, really, we just said on the last lap we can battle and manage to stay in front. But congratulations to Paul. I know he's been struggling a bit in, in testing, but he's managed to keep up in the race. And uh, just want to say thanks to Walk Racing and Mr. C as well. And of course, just to round up, of course, that's three race victories that you've had in the first four races. So the, the, your chance for the championship is looking very strong. So, of course, obviously, it's a good momentum that you're taking, of course. I'm sure that you'll agree you've got some great pace overall on the team going forward to the next few rounds. So you must be feeling very confident at the showing that you've had both at Curitiba and here tonight at Zolder. Yeah, um, looking good so far. We've just got to keep it up, keep up the, the practice that we're doing. And I think we've got a base set up that's working really well. We haven't changed it from this track to Curitiba. And it seems to be working, so it's looking good. Excellent stuff. Well, congratulations on the pole position and the two race victories, and fingers crossed that next time out at Oran Park, you'll be able to continue your run of form. But for now, congratulations, and well done on the two victories. Thank you. And of course, Rob, I believe, if he's around, I believe that you have the other man in that uh, walk racing team, of course. Um, just missed out on a podium in race one, but managed to get it after a small battle at the end with his teammates in race two. Rob, I believe you've got the other walk racing man. It's Paul Patrick. Yeah, Paul. So in, in the first race... It looked like you were struggling a bit um, in the beginning of the race and gained a lot of positions and at the end had a great battle with Torok. So how was it from your view? Yeah, like Adrian, I just had massive lag on the foot and it took me like five, six laps to get into it. And I, was, I mean, to be honest with you, I was struggling a lot anyway. Adrian was so fast around there, I wasn't really expecting to beat him. I mean, in, and in the second race, I was surprised to keep up with him, to be honest. So... Um, how was the battle against Jesper um, from your point of view? Because uh, we we saw a last corner move from Jesper. Yeah, he pulled my pants down on the last corner. So. 
a um yeah no I, I, I could have you know made it dirty and put him in the tires or something but I just, yeah, there's no point and um I mean it is a good move fair enough and I was just happy to um, get half decent result after the start. Ed, so. um, in the second race, you were following Adrian for the most part, and you know, of course, Adrian is leading the championship now out of uh, out of this event, and you are in second place. So it looks like you two are battling actually for the championship. So I hope you know what are your plans for the next races. Well, I mean, uh, w w at first we tried to get away from um, Solberg. Because it, like, I mean, he's fast in the toe, and uh, once we got a gap, I was we sort of talking on the um, on team speak and uh, just left it down to the last lap. But I didn't. There's no. I didn't really get close enough to be honest. So I didn't want to like ram him off the track or something. But we were just carrying going as we are. All right. Well, congratulations for your uh, podium finish and your good oh, good results here. And I think. Scott, you've got the next driver. Yeah, I'm going to have a chat to Tom Ely, of course, second in race one and pole position in race one, also fourth in race two. Uh, Tom, also, first of all, a brilliant lap to pull out uh, pole position for race one. And you had it for the most part, but just in the final few laps, you just had that little bit of advantage. Tell us how it happened from your point of view. And it seemed as though you had some really good pace, but just unfortunate that you just weren't able to keep Adrian behind for the final few laps. I think I was able to pull a gap, and then he just, he just got me, you know, I couldn't match his pace at all. Doing fifty ones in a race and I couldn't couldn't match that. So eventually it got by. And um because second place was still pretty strong, so of course a great result. And then coming into the race two of course, it seems as though your pace lacked a little bit of course and the top three seems to just pull away. So you were almost in a little bit of no man's land, but um obviously you were closed in a little bit by um Chris in the final few stages. So I mean were you a little bit nervous at all that Chris might have possibly been able to try and challenge at all in the final few laps? Yeah, I knew he was coming. I knew I'd probably have to defend. But it race two I was caught out by that massive stuttering. Everyone seems to have uh, mentioned it so far um, I couldn't believe it Like it was like game was freezing and then unfreezing and freezing and unfreezing a few laps it did settle down but yeah tough and of course, you're now running fourth in the championship. Of course, for anyone who's watching the broadcast, the championship standings, as they've been currently updated, are now on the screen. Uh, and Tom, you're currently sat fourth uh, standing right now. Uh, you're some 15 points behind Jesper. So um, do you think that the first couple of race weekends now at Curitiba and here at Zold has given you a lot of confidence going forward to the next few rounds starting at Oran Park in a couple of weeks? Do you think that's given you um, a lot of um, belief in the fact that you guys at Puppy Racing are going to be front runners and that you can challenge for podiums and race victories? I mean, how do you see your championship playing out for the rest of the season? I have no idea. We seem to have the pace for fighting at the top, so I just hope we can stay there and keep fighting. Well, fingers crossed that you can, and uh, congratulations for the pole position and for the podium today, and also for your fourth, strong fourth place as well. And fingers crossed it'll, uh, but you'll be able to buck the trend and uh, more of the same in Oran Park in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks. Now, Rob, I believe you've got uh, a man who was a bit up and down the field today, but uh, fifth place in race two. Rob, I think you've got uh, Chris Butcher with you. Yeah, Chris, we already heard what happened in race one. So my question is, how did you turn that around for race two, that you had such a great pace? Um, I, I I don't know if I'm honest. With you. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of randomly clicked around in the setup, but just did some tire pressures and changed the rear wing, and it just it just sort of worked. And for for a time, I had really decent pace, and um, got into a bit of a battle with Tom, which dropped me back a little bit. Um, but then I was I was catching him back up during the race, and um, with a couple of laps to go, I was only a few tenths behind, and then I um, I hit the tires again that took me out in race one. And I thought, okay, um, I'm not going to catch that gap now. So I just brought it home. I was happy with fifth place, to be honest with you, after um, no practice at all coming into it. Of course, it doesn't really look so good this uh, season in the championship for you. You're only in sixth place now. So do you think you've got uh, any chance in this league? Uh, it, it's going to be difficult, definitely. But, you know, it's it's a long championship. We're only two rounds in. There's another eight to go. And... Um, you know, let's let's not forget that last season I managed to get a, a you know quite a big gap until I had technical issues. But you know, it's not it's it's definitely possible. It's not impossible. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens, but it's definitely going to be tough. All right, thanks a lot, and back to Scott.
Yeah, I think we'll have a chat to a couple more drivers. So uh, we'll have a chat first of all with Jonathan Osseklint uh, of OSR. Jonathan, um, really good uh, weekend for you guys as a whole, really, for Octon Sim Racing. We've been really impressed both with myself and Rob with the turn of pace that you showed. Um, first of all, where has this turn of pace come from? Has, has it just been purely working the setup? Has it just been the fact that Zold has been a circuit that you've all seemed to be favoured? What is it that's been the magic kind of spark that's helped you guys up the field now? Because you were really challenging up in the top 10 for a lot of the time. Uh, difficult to say, but I think uh, for this round we did a lot more testing than for round one and a lot more testing than for any other round we've done, to be fair. And then probably Solar suited us quite well as well, and we fiddled around a bit with the setup and found a few but a few sweet spots with uh, what what little you could do, and uh, it worked. Of course, that followed that, that followed that up with a very strong top 10 finish in race one. Just talk us through how the race played out from your point of view, because you always seem to be up there just picking up the pieces from any drivers that really had a few tough occasions in that race. So you seem to really luck into the fact that you were the, managed to keep it on the road, and you were awarded with a very strong, as we said, top 10 finish. So um, just tell us how that went for you. Um, start went awful because I got a lot of wheel spin. Uh, I think Klaus managed to get around me in turn one around outside. Then bit of incident with him at turn two, I'm not sure if you caught that or not, but looked like he got into the rear end of one of his teammates and I couldn't avoid him because I was already committed and contact was made. Uh, other than that, just tried to stay consistent and uh, when others started to lose their ties, I tried to push a bit, had a good battle with Chris. Fortunately, uh, I missed my breaking point for one of the corners and took him with me into the grass uh, and gravel after that, I don't know what happened, but after that, after that incident and everything else, just consistently and trying to stay on track. And then race two, you were slightly further down the field, but of course, again, still a very consistent, solid run. Um, but obviously, just off the back of this, of this weekend, of course, again, it, d does it give you guys a lot of confidence that you've made the right direction in terms of you've gone in the right direction with setup? And does that give you a bit more confidence and belief going forward into Oran Park that you guys can be up near the front and challenging for regular points finishes? Definitely, because uh, I think all of us like Soren Park, so that should be a very good round for us. Uh, with the extra pace, uh, I think we're all hoping for a really good really good round over there. Well, fingers crossed you can keep it up, and congratulations for the two results today. Um, Rob, Rob, I believe you possibly have maybe one more driver to speak to at the moment? Yes, I want to have a word with Ryan Walker. So, um, Ryan... Race 2, it was probably the best performance I've seen from you in the minis, and then we went to your car and was upside down, so what happened there? Uh, I, I was doing okay, I was just uh, keeping an eye on the gaps to in front of me and behind me. Uh, it was pretty obvious that Chris was much, much quicker than me, so I just decided to focus on the gap behind me. But, uh, I was maintaining a good gap, and uh, I headed into the first again, and the, uh, the entry was okay, but I just carried too much speed and also lost my concentration. Bounced off the tyres, rolled the car, and uh, the en engine blew up. Well, that uh, was very unlucky, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it looked a bit funny when, when we found your car there, but <laughs> of course it's also sad because you had a great run. So, um, what do you expect from the next round? Uh, for the next round, uh, I would love to try and finish in the top 10. But because I feel I've got the pace to finish in the top 10. I've just not had the luck at the moment, but from uh, it, the signs, it signs today, but the, the, the pace is there for top 10 finishes. Just got to convert it, uh, convert it into a finish and uh, we'll get there. All right. Thanks a lot. And Scott, do you have anyone else or is that it? Uh, I think that's going to wrap up the interview, so thank you very much to everyone who's taken the time out uh, to have a chat with us uh, post-race, of course, and congratulations once again to Adrian Campford and to Walk Racing, and of course to everyone who finished on the podium uh, this weekend, of course to our podium finishers, mainly Adrian Campford, uh, Tom Ely, Jesper Talborg, and Paul Patrick, all for getting a rostrum finish tonight in Zolder. Of course, let's bring them back up on the standings for me to see exactly how the championship looks after the two races here. It's uh, Zolder, and this is exactly how the championship stands, if you can see it. So, Paul Patrick now has a, I say Adrian Campbell, I should say, has a six-point lead over his teammate Paul Patrick, 113 to 107. Jesper Tolborg is now third with 96 points, 15 ahead of Tom Ely in fourth. 
Peter Hennenberg, with some very mixed results, remains in 5th place with 70 points, but now he's only 1 point ahead of Chris Butcher in 6th with 69 points. Then there's a great scrap going on for the bottom end places in the top 10 with Gus Verve with 43 points. Jimmy Hughes and Ryan Cannell are tied for 8th on 40 points, with Matty Orban 10th with 37, and Diego Silva non -racing, not racing today, but still 11th with 34, and then John Monroe, Pipo Rodriguez are now equal 12th with 26, and then Jonathan Osserklint with 25, and Klaus Nearing at the bottom, finishing with 24. So before we wrap up then, uh, to look at some details for the next few races and how you can keep up to date with social media. Uh, just final thoughts then, Rob. I mean, two very exciting races. I think a little bit more exciting than maybe we were possibly anticipating. But again, a very strong performance, again, for Walk Racing. Uh, Adrian set the pace, but obviously the likes of Tom Mealy and Jesper Talborg, they're going to keep them honest throughout the season. They're certainly going to be the two main contenders to both Adrian and Paul at the front of the field this, this, this season. Well, I really like the first race because there we could see three teams going hard for the battling hard for the podium positions, and um, you know, third place was decided in the final corner. It was good to see in the second race. I would have hoped for a little bit more battling for the, for the win, but still got a bit of battling at the end, and uh, it was close race as well. So hopefully we'll see more of these close races uh, in the next rounds. Well, fingers crossed. And to keep up to date with when the next round's going to be, of course, you can stay up to date with everything on, on our social media pages and everywhere that we have a presence. Of course, we have the website, touringproseries.com, once again, uh, for all of our live broadcasts, including live timing and, of course, our TPS rankings and our Hall of Fame. Uh, also, facebook.com forward slash touringproseries. Of course, give us a like on there. We, ever, we always want to keep increasing our fan base. Also, twitter.com forward slash touring underscore pro or just simply at touring underscore pro. Give us a tweet anytime. And of course, if you missed anything for this broadcast or any recent broadcast that we have produced, then go ahead and head to youtube.com forward slash Touring Pro Series. Click the subscribe button. It's free. It takes just two seconds and you'll be kept up to date with every single broadcast that we do. Which you can watch back at your leisure in full. Now, of course, the next racing you'll see back on to TPS live broadcasts is going to be the next round of the Virtual Clio Series. And that is going to be here at Zolder, which means that while the mini teams move off to their next round, the Clio teams will come in to take their place. That'll be next Monday, 5th of May. Of course, Bank Holiday Monday. What better way to spend your Bank Holiday evening than to come and watch some top quality virtual tin top action here on Touring Pro Series at Zolder under the lights again with the Clios. And of course, the next time you'll see the minis will be over down under in Australia. It's going to be at the now unfortunately defunct Oran Park circuit. No longer exists as a real racing as a real racing course, but of course, thanks to the magic of sim racing, it is revigored and revitalised here. In it is um, it's revamped and revitalised once again and brought back to life thanks to GameStop Car 2013. So congratulations again to Adrian Campfield and to Walk Racing for their dominance. Can anyone stop them? Well, we'll find out what well, the likes of Puppy Racing and THR came close. But if they can over, whether or not they can overhaul them remains to be seen. For myself, Scott Woodwist, and for Robert Beeson Mueller, thank you very much for watching another TPS broadcast. And we'll catch you next week on Monday for the Virtual Clear series. And in a couple of weeks' time for round three of the Virtual Mini Challenge from Oran Park. But until then, take care and thanks for watching. Bye for now. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week.